I wonder what it's like to taste your flesh. You know, you keep cutting yourself up and that lot. I said, you give me some. He went, yeah. Be a minute, nurse, come up with Miss, can you just do me a favour? Just pass me that tobacco, please. I opened it up in front of her and she went, what's that? I went, this is flesh. I went, what? Well, I... I started chewing, it was chewy. <laughs> so I started chewing it. I started eating it, she blew on a whistle. She went, he's just eating that, he's flesh. <laughs> and obviously, I don't look at him, I think he's nice. He ain't got much meat on him, so I won't eat him. My stepfather's played around with the criminal justice system where basically he thinks it's easier to get time in a mental hospital than it is in prison. But boy, it's not, is it? Not from my experience. My stepfather turned around and said, the best way for you, you need to tell the authorities that you're voices in me. head. I went like, what? He went, just tell them that you, they're telling you to attack people, kill people. I went, kill who? Went, kill men, kill women, kill anyone. The psychiatrist became involved and they said that they're going to section me. I was clinically diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. I've never heard voices in my life. It was probably all the rage from the childhood, the abuse, and it all comes together and it comes as an explosion. And I told him, I said, I wanted to kill you. I went many times, I wanted to come in and stab you, stab you to death and kill you. And I was just like sticking him, sticking him, sticking him, stabbing him, stabbing him all over his body. So yes, I was remanded into Red Bank Secure Unit. I came across this 13-year-old in there. I got talking to him and I said, sir, what, what, what's your name, mate? He went, John. He went, I went, what, John? John, John who? John Venables who killed Jamie Bulger. I went, no. And straight away, I just stormed over to him and I said, you killed Jamie Bulger, you killed Jamie Bulger. He went, no, I didn't, no, I didn't. And then we started fighting and we're going to I kill you. And I went, I kill you, I kill you, I kill you. And he was saying, I kill you. And do you know the weird thing about it is, it was like a holiday camp. John Venables was living a life of Riley. And I thought, right, fair enough, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do a threat to kill letter. I personally believe I may murder, kill a Rampton Authority person within Rampton Hospital DSPD unit. Here are some names I may kill. Three, three pages of them. Yeah, so I put, I will and can get to any staff member. Rest in peace, the sorry f who will be killed within Rampton Hospital DSPD unit. Yours, the untreatable psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> untreatable psychopaths? How the hell are you supposed to treat one? You can't. I'm still untreatable to this day. It's all around my neck, it's strangling me. I can't get away from it. I tried to, I tried to turn my life around. Today, you are in for a treat. We have never been down the road of interviewing somebody classified as an untreatable psychopath. He's got a heartbreaking story of what happened to him in his childhood. And I must give you a warning. There is an accumulation of events and there's an explosion in his head that causes um, extreme violence and then threats of extreme violence. For the past 10 years, has been a free man. He's not been in trouble. He's an absolute gentleman. He has been counseled by Dr. Bob. And Dr. Bob has helped his change his thinking patterns. We're getting Dr. Bob on as well, who has been the therapist for Maudsley, Charles Bronson, numerous serial killers and psychopaths. So there really is a really important redemption part to this story. To go from the extremes, and some of you... You know, you may be thinking this is terrible what he did, and he does accept the things he did are terrible. But you've got to look at the chain of events that led to these things and how the work he has put in to get out and behave in a way that is not causing any further harm to society. He was sentenced to a short term, and he ended up doing decades because of his classification. So before we go into the story arc then, starting with the childhood, I'm just going to give you a few more details. As well as being classified as an untreatable psychopath, a classification which remains on him to this day, he's the only person to escape from an ICU. Even Bronson didn't do that. He ended up in a DSPD, escaped from there twice. What is a DSPD? Yeah, uh, no, nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll tell you, DSPD stands for Dangerous Severe Personality Disorder Unit. 
Uh, it was drawn up after the killing of Lynn and Megan Russell. It was Michael Stone, who apparently I know that he's claiming his innocence now in the uh, criminal justice system in prison and that lot. But it was drawn up after his conviction. And it was Michael Howard then, who was the Home Secretary. And basically, he was trying to say, we need to do something with untreatable psychopaths. We, need, we can't just lock them up. But I think he was doing more danger than necessary. It was the same with David Blunkett with the IPP sentences. And you get these Home Secretaries that try do something good, but obviously it's, it's absolutely a disaster. So uh, they built these units uh, and they built one in Rampton Hospital, they built one in Broadmoor Hospital and they did a couple in prison. The prison ones, I think, uh, were in Franklin or Whitemoor. They're the voluntary ones. But if you go on them and you keep on misbehaving, then you will get sectioned and go to the places like Broadmoor or Rampton. So yeah, uh, DSPD stands for Dangerous Severe Personality Disorder Unit. I think that the mental health services system went to the extreme of diagnosis that like you get your diagnosis as paranoid schizophrenia, uh, psychopaths, uh, you get all these different kinds of diagnoses. And I think that the government was just trying to go too far with a diagnosis of DSPD. DSPD, dangerous severe personality disorder. And they do this uh, psychopathy test. And obviously, I think if you score more than 40%, then you're classed as a psychopath. And that's what they've done. They've done this assessment behind my back called psychopathy, uh, psychopathy uh, checklist revised, the PCLR test. So they did it behind my back. This is a consultant forensic, consultant forensic psychiatrist. He was the clinical director of the personality disorder directorate services in Rampton Maximum Security Hospital. And he was also my psychiatrist who was looking after me, detained in Rampton Hospital. At first, he said basically, I didn't fit the criteria to be on the DSPD system, which means I wasn't a psychopath. I was just suffering as suffering as someone who's got a personality disorder that needs assessment and treatment. Uh, and then obviously because my behaviour escalated six months later, which is I will get to where I escaped out of one of the most secure places in Britain, the ICU, the intensive care unit for the most dangerous disturbed prisoners, which held people such as Charlie Bronson uh, and obviously Ian Hunter. I know he's a nasty monster, that guy. What did Ian Hunter do, just for the viewers? Ian Hunter, he was the one who killed uh, Ollie and uh, Jessica Wells, the two little girls. Uh, and he was assessed in Rampton Hospital for his mental health uh, to see if he was insane for what he was done. And basically, they kept him in the ICU away from everyone else because he was basically uh, suitable to attack. Obviously, people wanted to kill him. I was there, not for that reason, clearly, because I'm not nothing like that. I'm, my crimes have never existed, anything like that. No convictions, no one's done nothing. My crimes and convictions is violence and violence and violence only. As we'll get into the story. But yeah, they turned around and said, the last person that was held in this cell, which I was, is Ian Huntley. Um, Charlie Bronson was held on Derwent Ward, uh, which was obviously a unit where, again, was total isolation. Uh, Charlie Bronson has not escaped out of that, but I did escape out of that, and that's when we get to that information. But yeah, DSPD is classed as the dark side. They used to scare and intimidate people who was on the main part of the unit and say, oh, if you don't behave yourself, we'll send you to the dark side. The dark side was the DSPD system, which means we can hold you there for a maximum of 30, 40 years. And you do treatment there, you'll never get out because that's what Michael Howard wanted this unit for, to lock up untreatable psychopaths and do devious treatment. You know, they were wanting, what, 10, 20, 30 years treatment and just never get out because you're classed as untreatable psychopath. Untreatable psychopaths, how the hell are you supposed to treat one? You can't. I'm still untreatable to this day. I've still got that diagnosis around my label. Every time I go to doctors, every time I go there, it's that, na that label, that link that's all around my neck, strangling me. I can't get away from it. Uh, so basically, what, what happened is the psychiatrist, he turned around and said, I don't fit the criteria, but like I said, six months of my escalating behavior because I didn't want to be in there, all of a sudden, I fit the criteria. I turned to him and I said, hang on a minute, you said I don't fit the criteria. And you know what he said to me? Listen to this for abusive powers, what he'd done. He turned around and went, I can make anyone fit the criteria. How disgusting is that? This is a psychiatrist, a consultant forensic psychiatrist, who's well known in the medical profession, who, who's abusing his powers. I can make you fit the criteria. I can make, he's basically saying, I can make, make anyone fit the criteria. So am I, a di am I diagnosed? convicted psychopath or what or or is this a misdiagnosis how many years were you incarcerated for oh wow uh, that's a question uh, I, I go right back until the age of 14 so the age of 14 to the age of 36 and i'm 42 now and, and the only time i've had out in the community in that period of time was probably 12 months in the community because whilst i've been in the community 
I've been sectioned from the community into medium psychiatric hospitals, so I wasn't able to escape or anything like what well, I did try. But yeah, uh, from twenty one years then. Yeah, about that. Yeah, and how many years? How many years? How many years did you do in Rampton Maximum Security Hospital? Two and a half years. Two and a half years, but they want in uh, to be someone to be judged and treatable. They're looking at what twenty five, thirty years to be judged and treatable in a maximum security hospital. But I did it in two and a half years, and I, obviously we'll get to the story of why they couldn't cope with me. Why they thought we're just getting off. You know, we, yeah. we can't deal with him. The prison system couldn't handle me. Took me in Rampton. Rampton couldn't handle me. Getting back into the system with a new offence, which I committed a new offence, which we'll get to that. And obviously, I eventually got out. Uh, I, and people say that you can't beat the system. Clearly, I did beat the system because I won't be here speaking to you right now. I st- if I wouldn't have done, which I'm going to get to, if I wouldn't have done what I did to get out of Rampton Maximum Security Hospital, I'd be still there now, rotting and festering. We won't be, t- we won't be having this conversation. I'd still be in total isolation by myself, bre- breaching security, threatening staff, assaulting staff. Probably ended up with what? I don't know, double life sentences. <laughs> and we're going to get to all that. It's coming yeah. and it is extreme. The whole story is extreme. Let's go back then to where were you born? Halifax, a little town called Halifax, West Yorkshire. And what was it like for you growing up? Uh, right, going right back, uh, there was my mum, my dad, uh, my sister, uh, my biological father, uh, and he left the family when I was about age five. Uh, he had an affair with another woman, and it, it became difficult for my mum to cope with, obviously bringing up two children back then. Uh, probably like it is with anybody and uh, it was heartbreaking for my mom she just didn't see anybody else or anything like that and I think as I was growing up I always wanted a father figure you know someone when you go to school someone would say oh I'm going to play football with my dad I can't say that I'm just brought up around my mom you know not it's it's a bit embarrassing really because I didn't have that male role model in my life so I used to go see my dad every now and again and uh, me and my sister, and that became very abusive at times. It uh, make us do things like uh, it, like do SAS kind of stuff, like doing squats and press ups and kind of rubbish like that. And it was into his Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris kind of. You know, How old rubbish. were you? Uh, probably about five, six, seven. You know, like doing squats and you know, yeah, just things like that, just <sighs> stupidity. You know, and obviously then would uh, if we misbehave, my sister would obviously get her hair pulled and she'd get a slap across the face. I would start getting a belt and a buckle, and then obviously it would end up to the fists and kidney punches as I were getting older from the age of, what, 9, 10, 11. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the violence started very young from my biological father, but it, it came to a bit more extreme when my stepfather uh, came into my life. His name was Joe, I can say that first name, and uh, he was a monster. He was, yeah, he was a real monster. He, he was the one that really battered my life mentally and physically and i'll get to why i'll tell you about mentally about what he tried to make me do and i followed him because it was a role model that i followed where he told me to lie to certain authorities police and psychiatrists that i hear voices in my head i've never heard voices in my head but we'll get to that and these are where all the diagnoses were coming flying out from conduct disorder paranoid schizophrenic i was clinically diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic i've never heard voices in my life but I was told by my stepfather because he threatened me and intimidated me. And if I didn't do what I what I asked him, what he, what he told me to do, he'd give me a beating. So I did what was right. I followed what I followed his instructions, which was an improper. It, it wasn't proper, was it? The stepfather oh. like that telling me to lie to authorities, and I know why he's done that. He probably thought that I couldn't do the stints in the criminal justice system because my stepfather's played around with the criminal justice system and the mental health system where basically he thinks it's easier to get time in a mental hospital than it is in prison. But boy, it's not, is it? Not from my experience. I would rather serve a life sentence in prison. I shouldn't say that because of all the lifers that are serving there, rather than spend the time that I spent in Rampton Maximum Security Hospital. I'm hoping that you'll get that feeling from what I'm saying. When your stepfather came into your life, was it nice at first or was it bad from the get-go uh, it was nice at first uh, uh and obviously i was still seeing my dad at the time and i don't think he was liking that because he was trying to make a relationship with my mom and he got married they got married and then that's when start things start to go downhill he'd like uh for instance we'd go out and have a game of football once he'd take me fishing once he snap up the rod throw it into the canal and that's when he turned around and said come on let's, we're, we're gonna do this i want to do what he took me burgling and that was the age of nine, ten, just 
just a couple of couple of years when he came into my life. So basically, he took me to a house, he put the back window in, he'd go in, steal the goods, he'd tell me to stand outside. If anyone comes, whistle. So that's me watching that. And then after I watched it a couple of times, he would send me into the house and burgle the items and come back out. And sometimes I go into the house, take loads of things out, and I take a lot of rubbish from the from the burglary because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm I'm just taking things like that, but I'm also taking things that I would thought that would impress him and it wouldn't impress him. Then he take me down the back alley, say, What what have you got? And I say this, that, and over, and he turned around and said, You've got basically a lot of shit, and then he smashed my face in. So but I'd have to get better at doing burglaries and taking what he's telling me to get out of the house. So yeah, that's from the age of what, nine upwards. Because of the nature of what he was doing to you, I just have to ask you, do you waive your anonymity? Because the police have required us, if people are have bad things happen to them as kids, we have to make sure they waive their anonymity. No, uh, no, yeah, I know what you're saying. I could, uh, the, 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 my stepdad was a monster, and if he was still alive to this day, which uh, I haven't come to that yet, I, I would love to have gotten done for child neglect. But no, you, I, you, I live with that. And, but you do waive your anonymity? Yeah, yes. I, I live with that, and uh, he's dead now. He died of a drug overdose. I collected his ashes, and I put him down the drain in Blackpool, where he was begging on the streets where he belongs. So I closed the door on that horrible monster. What was the worst abuse he did to you? The worst abuse is uh, when I was 14 years old. Uh, I, I kept a secret from when I was about 10. I got uh, sexually abused by my granddad. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. Uh, so as you were kids, you, you know, I was trying to get one over my stepdad, John, saying, I've got a secret, I've got a secret, like kids do, because he, he couldn't get that from me, because that's what my granddad told me to do. He, he told me, basically, if I was to tell anyone about the sexual abuse that happened repeatedly from the age of 10 upwards, <sighs> uh, that he would take his art tablets and kill himself, and it would be my responsibility as a 10-year-old that I've killed my granddad. So it was, it was messed up, pretty messed up, actually. Uh, and I told my stepdad that I've got a secret, and difficult every time I come to this part. It's really difficult, man. So, yeah, just bear with me. He he, uh, he battered me black and blue. He had butted me, fisted me to death, near enough. To tell him what the secret was, and then. And then when I told him, he just grabbed me and hugged me. Weird. Turned around and said, Granddad's been touching me. He's been sexually abusing me. He just grabbed me, just put his arms around me and then hugged me tight. And that's when he realised that he's just beat me up for nothing. And At that point, was your grandfather still alive? Yes. Did he confront him or anything? My mum did, yes. So was he... He threatened my mum as well and said if he goes to the police, he'll take his heart tablets and kill himself. So the secret was kept a secret still. And years down the line, uh, Grandad was suffering and he was dying of cancer, thank God. And my mum turned around to me and said, uh, my dad, which is my granddad, is dying. Do you want to go ask him questions about what happened when you were younger? Go ask him. And uh, I had this big camcorder and I wanted evidence. And took it to the hospice that we were dying. Took it next to the TV. I couldn't even do that right. Press record. I've got an audio, got a DVD there of him confessing to what he's done. I asked him about why he abused me. Was he abused? Has he abused any of my other family? And uh, to my horror, he confessed of sexually abusing me. I do have a copy of it on DVD, but I can't do nothing with it. It's just there for reference for people to believe what happened. But I was taken back because he didn't confess to just only sexually abusing me. Oh my God. And the family know about it as well, and that was kept all a secret. But yeah, I do have a copy of the whole thing on DVD. It's pretty heartbreaking. And I told him, I said, I wanted to kill you. I went many times, I wanted to come in and stab you, stab you to death and kill you. Uh, I don't know, I just, so difficult 
people who have been abused, you want to hurt them, you want to kill them, of course you do. Especially with someone of my status, violence and that lot. And uh, I don't know what it was, it's just you block it and it comes out in different ways. It comes out in aggression and that lot in other people and violence and crimes and prisons and hospitals. It comes out in all that. I really appreciate your honesty with this and for the viewers watching it, this is so important because through these interviews, we have learned that the root cause of crime, violent crime, murder, the main root cause is childhood trauma. And many adults who've been through the things that has been so honest about, they will not disclose those things. And all you see are the acts in adult life when they explode. Because when they explode on people, he had these intentions against his grandfather. Subconsciously, that's buried in them. And it, it reaches a point where, tipping point where they just explode. Even with killers, Dr. Bob, in his book, there's a point where the serial killer, he's killing over and over again these victims, but in his head, they're his abuser from when he was a child. See it over and over again until we understand what causes crime. We're never going to be able to address it properly. Being so honest, but telling his personal first-hand story that we can really get deep into understanding the nature of crime. And then once you've got the understanding of it, you can bring the tools in, people like Dr. Bob, to fix it. And we're going to see that part of the story arc towards the end. So it's good that you've put it into context. Yeah, it took know, a long time. It took years, uh, childhood, uh, teenage, adulthood. And yeah, well, I'll get to that where uh, me and Dr. Bob came up with a therapy technique, which I'll talk about, like you said, in, uh, near the time, which is called Stop Granddad Therapy, which we've just talked about. My granddad abuse, and I think it could be used in different aspects of DOP, you know, brother therapy. It, it, could, be, it could be used wide. All right, so you're committing crimes with your stepdad. Your stepdad's got you lying to the cops and stuff, and you're saying, telling them that you're hearing voices in your head. Age 14, that's when you start to get incarcerated. Yes. What led up to that then? Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be br brutally honest, and I'm, I'm ashamed to say this. I really am ashamed to say this, but uh, I don't know how to say this. With someone with my character, it was, it was a robbery that went wrong, uh, but I've got, to, I've got to explain what it was about. Uh, I, was, I was shown violence from my stepfather, robbing people, stabbing people. Uh, at the age of 14 year old, I was seeing this older woman, she was called Leona, and she was from Halifax. She was 28 year old, and he was having sex with me and I was 14. And in a way, obviously, because of the sexual abuse that was happening at that time, there was a lot of things that was happening around them teenagers years. There was my biological father, there was the physical and mentally abuse from him. There was the stepfather, the horrible stuff that was happening there, the drug abuse, the violence, the robbings, the burglaries. Then there was granddad sexually assaulting me. And then there's Leona, 28 year old woman, coming on to me and kissing me and having sex with me and starting a relationship and I was only 14 and I, I just wanted to be in a relationship but obviously clearly this wrong because in, in reality in terms she's class. Uh, I was seeing this woman and I was at school, I had a couple of older friends that are a couple of years, in, years older than me, I was 14, they were like nearly 15, 16 and they decided that you know I was, I was the crazy one so they gave me a knife and said come on go rob someone, we need some money. I think I was easily led at that time. I take responsibilities. I was bang out of order what I'd done. Uh, if I could take it back, I would. Uh, and they turned around and said, go rob him over there. So this guy was carrying a briefcase and they said, go rob him. So like I did, did charge me for robbery. I got done for robbery. They tried to get me robbery with violence. Uh, so yeah, I'm disgusted in that. I went away. Leona, she kept on seeing me throughout all my custodial time that I was in. The secure unit, which I'm going to get to, which I was detained in Red Bank secure unit. So you got arrested and they started to ask you stuff. And did you then at that point tell them you were hearing voices? That's right. That's yeah. what your stepdad had told you to that's say. That's right. So my stepfather turned around and said that you have, uh, I want you to turn around and tell the psychiatrist and the, and the doctors and the police that you have voices on. Why? He probably thought that I couldn't handle the time in custody. 
uh, because of the situation, maybe because of the crime that I committed. I knew I had violence in me, but yeah, that was not the kind of violence that I was wanting to express. Uh, but uh, a lot of other violence came out in a lot of different ways. Uh, and from an early age, it was just, it was wrong. Uh, there was there was like another incident, like, uh, I can say this, I can say this because it was just, it was wrong and I'm deeply ashamed and very apologetic. And I just want to put that out there. I know what, what people might think about it. Uh, but I've got to be honest. This is what it's about. It's about being honest. And not a lot of people would be honest with things like that, would they? No. Or, you know, people can judge me. People can say things. But I've got to be honest. Uh, so, yeah, my stepfather turned around and said, uh, the best way for you is that you need to tell the authorities that your voice is in my head. I went, like, what? He went, just tell them that you, they're telling you to attack people, kill people. I went, kill who? I went, kill men, kill women, kill anyone. I went, just just say that. Uh, he said, I said, yeah. He went, what, what, what? He said, just say that you're hearing a name of someone called David in your head that's talking to you, telling you to attack and kill people. And when they're talking to you, they're just like, when me and you were talking now, they're just like that. Just say that you can hear him talking to you all the time, telling you to kill and attack people. I went, right. And he said, if you don't do that, if you don't do as you're told or do as you say, you'll go away for a long time and I'll, I'll, I'll basically beat you. You need to listen to me. So I, he basically threatened me and intimidated me. He was threatening and intimidating and I just did what he asked me to do. He just came back from telling me to go back in the houses and rob the houses. So I did exactly that. So I'm in police interviews and I'm saying it was voices that was in my head telling me to attack it and rob it. So that's what I want. It was asking me questions. I was saying it were voices in me. I had a voice called David. David, it just started appearing at the time before. And it's just like me and you were talking now. So they've started to believe that. And I was on bail. Uh, I had to go see uh, an adult son, forensic services for children. They put me on Prozac, uh, which was some sort of antipsychotic medication, depressant at the time. And then they also put me on some sort of kind of liquid medication because that wasn't working with me. It, like, basically dosed me up. Uh, so I was 14-year-old on bail for that. And then, basically, my behaviours just started escalating whilst I was on bail. And uh, they talked to my social worker, my parents, and said that, basically, he needs to be locked up because he's going to hurt someone else again or commit further crime. So the, uh, the social worker said, well, he's more secure unit in Leeds is full. So my stepfather uh, turned around and said, well, can't you go to Red Bank Secure Unit? Uh, it was classed as the old approved school back in the day. And uh, she turned around to him, well, how do you know about it? Uh, he turned around and said, because I used to be detained in Red Bank Secure Unit. My stepfather was also detained in Red Bank Secure Unit, and he was also sectioned to Winnick Psychiatric Hospital, which is just down the road from Red Bank. He played the system. That's why he told me to play the system, because he played the system when he was younger. So he was held in... Uh, Red Bank Secure Unit when he was younger, when he was 15 for various offences. And I think he was, yeah, he was locked up with a girl called Mary Bell. She was 11 years old and she killed two children herself. So he's got his history and he told the social worker and said he believed that Red Bank would be a, a good place for me to go. So yes, I was remanded into Red Bank Secure Unit and I was remanded to a place called Vardy House Remand Centre. Uh, and whilst I was on there, there was other children on there at the age of 14, 15 year olds, uh, 13 year olds. Uh, I came across this 13 year old in there. Uh, I think he was 12, 13. And I got talking to him and I said, Sir, what, what, what's your name, mate? He went, John. He went, I went, what, John? John? John who? He went, John O'Brien. And I said, what are you in for, mate? He went, I'm in for a mucked up crime. He went, what are you in for? I went, robbery. Uh, and Obviously, I've come away and I've got talking to this other guy uh, and I, he stabbed up an old man 97 times over the body. Uh, that's his crime. He's done what he's done. And he went, do you know who you've just been talking to? I went, no, yeah, John. He went, John? I went, yeah, John. John O'Brien. He went, no, that's John Venables. John Venables who killed Jamie Bulger. I went, no, yeah, he is. And then just all came flashing back to me and straight away, I just stormed over to him and I said, you killed Jamie Bulger, you killed Jamie Bulger. He went, no, I didn't, no, I didn't. And then we started fighting and we're going to say, I kill you. And I went, I kill you, I kill you, I kill you. And he was saying, I kill you. Next thing, all this, the staff, which is social workers, came in, uh, pulled us both apart. He was on the floor. I was obviously trying to say, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, all the vengeance and all the, you know, you know, kill the kid, for, you know, for Christ's sake, Jesus Christ, you know what I mean? One of the worst crimes of 
in my entire life that you've heard, you know what I mean? So uh, they basically separated us. They put me over to the special unit then. Special unit is for people who were sentenced in Red Bank Security Unit. So then I had to go over there and separate because I had a fight with John Venables and I wasn't allowed to stay on that unit anymore. So yeah, that was the first time that I seen John Venables. But I did get to know him before and before obviously having his fight and I used to go into his room. I remember his room actually. Uh, it's got like these bulletproof windows. They are like bulletproof, they're still thick, it's unbelievable. So I class them as bulletproof windows. So they're very thick, lined, and you can see out of it. And do you know the weird thing about it is, there's a field there. And it's a train track as well. And I know what he'd done. It was absolutely devastating. Mm. So every morning, we used to hear a train track going past. So I was hoping it would traumatise him for what he's done. I went into his bedroom. People would say that he would support Everton. He wasn't an Everton fan. He was a Man United fan. I remember going into his bedroom. We had Man United curtains, Man United bedding, Man United lampshade. And also, he was also on ground leave. So he, he worked himself up to mobility ground leave, which means two to one. So two members of staff to one. So himself with two members of staff and he could walk around the grounds by himself well not by himself literally with two members of staff and no one would know every time people would get to know who john venables was which i got all this information when i was in there people were telling me they'd like switch john venables from robert thompson so robert thompson would be in newton aycliffe children's home and john venables would be in red bank security unit by the house in the remand center and kept away from everyone else as soon as people got to know they'd switch them around in different security units like uh, red sands Eastmore and uh, Newton, a uh, Newton Aycliffe, like all these children's zones that similar to Red Bank, what we had. Uh, me personally, Red Bank, you uh, Red Bank Secure Unit was, and uh, I'd say it wasn't, it wasn't a prison, it wasn't a young offenders, it was, it was basically, yeah, like you say, a children's zone, but it was, it was luxury, and it makes me angry to say, obviously, I was in there for what I'd done, but for someone like John Venables in a place like that in a place like luxury, walking around, going to places like Old Trafford, going to Gulliver's World in Warrington, going to Liverpool when you get, we get pocket money in there. So when you get pocket money, you can go into Liverpool and buy, you know, decent clothes like Adidas Nike or buy a sound system or whatever. You can have a sound system in there. You can have a TV in there. Uh, and it was just unbelievable that he had these luxuries. Also, we also had in there a motorbike and a, a goat car facility so we would learn it we, we was able to learn how to build motorbikes and go karts and ride them on the site itself we had a little dirt track and we used to take out motorbikes so the, the security unit learned us how to ride motorbikes up to uh, kmx 125 50 we were starting on a 50 cc up to a kmx 125 and the go karts again we just build them up and ride them as well i think it's, it's quite a bit of a luxury to think we had his own gym in there we went to swimming pool we went to wicked swimming baths it was like a holiday camp. John Venables was living a life of Riley. Disgusting. So when they took you out of the unit, it was like a team of officers. Yeah, team yeah. of officers took me over to the special unit. And I, as soon as I got over to the special unit, people were saying, uh, what, you've been sentenced and all that. I went, no, don't even remind them, just had a fight with John Venables. They went, oh, yeah, we know John Venables. And people, as soon as people get to know, they send us all three to the special unit. I went, yeah, I'm here. So you heard that, you know, it was Venables and he committed this crime. Yeah. What was the thought process? You know, I know you said you exploded, but can you, I know it's a long time ago, so can you remember yeah. slowly what happens in your head when you get that, when that takes over? Well, I, I've got a little brother myself. So my little brother was little. So that's what came straight into my head. You know, it could have been my little brother. So I just came up, raged, and it just, Rage straight away. He's killed a kid. You know what I mean? He's, he's not just killed a kid. He's killed a kid in the most awful way mm -hmm. ever. It's just That's wow, it's absolutely disgusting, traumatizing. And to, to hear all that again, and the way that he is, you, know, you hear that. I've heard that obviously people are going back up to Red Bank Security now because it's like locked off. And I want to still go back up there. And you get people talk about John Venables and that he was in this, that room, and that. People don't know only if people that were there. And it's, I, I keep looking on documentaries for the real people that used to be there so they could talk about it, like me, who was really locked up with John Venables. I was really locked up with John Venables. He used to, he's, he's, he's a, I think he's, he changed his name to O'Brien. I know we're not supposed to talk about his identity because he has different identities, don't he? You're not supposed to expose his identity. But that's what his identity was. 
uh, he got his name, which was John O'Brien, but I think he, uh, he was adopted by his stepfather or his dad at the time, or he took his name. And they used to come up and visit him because I, I remember the visitors and he used to, I think his mom and his dad or someone used to come up and visit him. And now when I used to have my visit and my mom and my sister used to come up and see me, he used to say, that's John Venables there. Is it? And my mom like, just like looking around, she went, is so yeah, my mum was pretty devastated to see someone like that and to see someone like that in a unit where I was held with one of the most notorious, horrible monster children of our, our lifetime. Do you think the parents should have been held accountable for what he did? John Medibus' parents? Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely for bringing him up. Like, you know, every parent should be, like my parents, they should be accountable for obviously what's happened. My mum... Basically, from my abuse, my mum, she didn't know about it. When she did know about it, she tried. She was threatened. She was intimidated by her own dad. Basically, if you, if, if you go tell to if you go tell police, I can't handle it, I'll kill myself. My mum was left in a similar situation with me. She was classed as vulnerable. I can't blame my mum like that in them circumstances. But John Venables' parents, yeah, definitely. It was, you know, what, what, learnt, what, what learnt him to go into, you know, supermarkets and, and steal children and, and do the awful things. Where, where's it come from? What, what did the parents let them watch violent films, Chucky films, child play films? You've got to have a guidance over watching, you know, what your children watch and what they do. If, 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 that, if the parents didn't have no, you know, guidance to that child, then it's just gone and done that. So, yeah, I, I'd say, yeah, definitely. The, the parents have to be accountable, yes. So you got your three-year sentence in Redback. Yes, uh, whilst I was in Redback Secure Unit, uh, I was playing up in there, and uh, I was keep on then I was hearing voices, and the mental health services became involved whilst I was detained in Redback Secure Unit, and uh, I was just talking in the mirror. I don't know, I just playing these behaviours up. It, it was just constantly, every time I would get into trouble, I thought, well, I just say your voices because that's what I was learned to say. So I kept up, I kept up that lie. And uh, the psychiatrist became involved and they said that they're going to section me and put me in a hospital in Presswich called the Garden Unit. So they sectioned me on a section 49, which was a transfer from the school unit with a restriction held by the Home Office. So that I couldn't be released because I'm still doing time and put me in the garden unit in Presswich, Manchester. And whilst I was in there, they put me in this padded room because I kept kicking off. And this padded room had like foam coming out of the ceiling and the, the, the you know the ceiling and the walls, and I just like biting chunks out of it, biting chunks out of it. And I kept wanting to smash my head against the wall and that lot because I thought my head's so messed up. I had this like thing in my head when I was like 14, 15. If I smash my head against the wall loads of times, it'll hopefully try to restart my brain. And I won't have these mad thoughts in my head of all this kind of shit. I was just a child. That's what I was thinking. I don't know. It was just one of them. So then they put like this rubber thing on my head because every time I was on the ward, I'd like smash my head. And they said, what, what are you doing for? And I, I said, I want, I, want, I want my brain to restart because I don't want to be like this anymore. Uh, and that's all I could do. Uh, so then obviously every time I start kicking off, at the age of 15, this is the first time I was depot injectioned. Depot injection, uh, it's called an acuphase. Basically, you're getting like five, six members of staff, five, six, seven, eight, depending on how many they are or what they are. So they're basically like, come near you. This was the first experience that I've had of this. And it was horrible, given that I was abused as well. It was just the way that it happens because that abuse kicked in as well, how they did it. So they'd like talk me, come around, and I'm thinking, what are they coming around for? Then they'd jump on me, restrain me, turn me around, pull my pants down so my bum's revealing and put a, a, an injection into my bum cheek. They call it a depo injection. And it was on, I was on Clopixel and Dipixel. These are very, very strong antipsychotic medications where it's called in, intermuscle depo injection. And it used to be called the old liquid kosh back in the day, Ligactyl. I've been on the Ligactyl as well. So they put Clopixel, Dipixel into me and zumped me out and it's called an acuphase. An acuphase is where you wiped out for three days so, like, I'd sit in the day area, they'd, like, walk me around, two members of staff, sit down in a, a, a settee or a sofa, and I'd, like, go to sleep. And they'd, like, wake me up and say, it's tea time. I'd eat my tea and then go straight back to sleep. So I'd be zonked out for three totally days, not knowing what day it is or anything like that. And sometimes they even put you in a chair where it's got plastic furniture. So if you're pissing, if, you, if you're weighing yourself, 
or you, you know, you're putting yourself it's into the chair and then they clean you because you can't control, you can't control your bowels that bad because you just, you wiped out, you zombied out on this medication. So yeah, it's quite, quite serious medication. So that was the first time that I ever had, had it happen. Uh, and after that, I come out after three days and then I do it again. I, I go for the staff or I attack them or I smash up the wards and then next thing they jump on me again put me a depot injection in me again, and then they start putting me in seclusion. And then after a while, I didn't, I didn't like it, so I just kept quiet. And then obviously I knew it would come up to my release date as well from the security unit. So I behaved myself. Then they put me back in Red Bank security unit. Then they put me in the open unit, uh, which is called reintegrating back into society. And then I got back out into society at the age of 16 and a half. Was Venable still there when you went back? Uh, yeah, I believe he was, yeah, uh, but he was still in the Vardy House Remand Centre. He, no, you couldn't see him, so special unit is over here, Vardy House is over here, you, you couldn't, you couldn't, it was a locked ward, you couldn't see if you were walking around the grounds or anything like that. They'd obviously like, they'd have uh, the walkie-talkies and remember stuff, so when he's walking around the grounds, us people could, we couldn't see him, we couldn't pass him on the walkway, so they'd make sure that he's not being seen or anything like that to get abuse out or anything like that. So you're trying to get out now, you're behaving yourself. Yeah. There's no more incidents in this event. Yeah. And then do you get released? I got released at 16 and a half, yeah. What was that like? Uh, it was, yeah, it was good to be released, uh, but my behaviours didn't, didn't go well then. I uh, got in a relationship with a girl. Uh, she was 23. Uh, I didn't know how to have a relationship, really, to be honest. So she was playing out on call with me. Uh, I was being childish, immature, couldn't hold down a job. I was out a couple of months. And then obviously, uh, authorities were involved again, mental health services, so I think I was two months in the community. This is the 12 month all in all that I was in. So it's like little snippets that I'm giving you. So I was two months in the community. And then obviously, uh, the hospital staff from St. Louis Hospital in Huddersfield Psychiatric Services would become involved. And they come to my house and they section me from my house uh but again my stepdad was still involved in my life and he turned around and said you can't cope you, you need to go back into the hospital i went and then what 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 do i do then it, it, I, I don't know what i'm supposed to do it's like he just didn't want me around and he he, he told me to go do things and i, I could do it again uh even though i was 16 and a half I, i've just felt so in in his in his world do you know what i mean and it's like used me as a, a, a tool, like, as he knew I was crazy, and go threaten him, go get a drink off him, go into that shop, go do that, go do that. And to be honest, in a way, I wanted away from that because he was still with my mom. He was still abusive and threatening to my mom. And he told me to go, uh, go to a pub, get dressed on naked, have a poo, and wipe it all over me and start eating it. So, yeah, so I did that. Uh, and the police came and the uh, ambulance came and they sectioned me. And I just continued like that. And they put me in a locked ward in St. Luke's. And I eventually got ground leave. And then I absconded on there. I smashed a broken bottle. I threatened two nursing staff. And I went, please just let me go. Let me go. And they went, we can't, we can't. Just put the broken bottle down. I went, I'll stab you, I'll stab you. And I went, it was. I went, I will, I will, I need to go. Just release me, just release me. And he said, no, it knocked me back another six months, that. So that was not good. Uh, and then I eventually got back out. Uh, and then after that, yeah, I got back out and I was doing all right for about a month. And then I committed some burglaries and uh, some assaults. And... I got done for harassment as well on my ex-girlfriend. Harassment, assaults, and burglaries. Uh, so they reminded me to Doncaster Prison uh, when I was 17, 17 and a half-ish, around that time. Uh, and I was waiting on remand there. And there was these diagnoses where psychiatrists were becoming involved. And I remember this Asian woman come up to see me when I was in Doncaster Prison on the healthcare. And I was zombied up. I was on medication because uh, I was classed as suffering from mental illness, ear apparently hearing voices, which I never heard. I just kept up lying. So yeah, I did psychiatrist and it was an Asian woman that come to see me. And she said that I'm from Rampton Maximum Security Hospital and I've come to assess you for its suitability. Uh, so she was telling me, asking all these questions and all that kind of rubbish. 
at the end of the assessment, I says, but what does that mean then? She went, well, you're not 18 at this time, so it's difficult to legally diagnose you as a, give you a clinical diagnosis. But it looks like that you do have some sort of form of mental illness like schizophrenia, uh, and you don't fit our high security at this time. That was the very first time that Ramson Ramson Security Hospital became involved in my life. So it's like there was wanting me for a very long time, and you know, Rampton kept getting brought up quite a few times and, you know, I kept escaping it. I thought, you know, you're not getting me. I don't want to go there. Uh, and whilst I was there, uh, another psychiatrist became involved and she was from St. Andrew's uh, Psychiatric Hospital, private run hospital. Uh, and I went in there because they said I had learning disabilities. I suffered from learning disabilities. I had a low IQ of 70, 75 or something like that. I believe my IQ was much higher in different things. I believe I'm educated on different things in a different way. I don't believe my IQ was that low. I don't know, it could have been what they said. So they put me on a LD ward, learning disability wards. And again, I was kicking off left, right and centre there. And they medicated me up. And whilst I was medicated up in this hospital, you won't believe what happened. I was that medicated up in this hospital. I was on my bed. Member staff were coming and talking to me. It touched me up. It touched me up while I'm, and I thought, this is just, I went, it's just it's never ending you know what i mean I'm, I'm i'm 17 years old here medicated up to eyeballs you got this member of staff touching me up on my bed like sitting down and talking to me and then putting his hand on the blanket but wearing my private parts is and then like grinding and touching me sexually assaulting me and i thought no this is just not happening again what's going on so i became very subdued quiet on the unit and i got talking to this female nurse and i built up confidence with this nurse what's the matter with you? You just don't see yourself now. And I just told her, I told her what, what this member of staff's gone. So the staff was horrified and all they did with him is move him onto another ward. The staff didn't like me because I was making an allegation against their members of staff. And I thought, I can't live here. They, they, they'd like buy takeaways for all the patients out of their money, the, the ward's money, and won't buy me any because of what I've done and made this allegation against this member of staff, I felt like I was targeted and it was rubbish. It was horrible. And I thought, I've got to escape. And I was on a locked, closed ward and you can't escape on a locked, closed ward. I don't know what it is about me trying to escape from places. It's just, just it must be something inside me. I just want to escape all the time. So yeah, I kept on saving me money. And when you're on this locked ward, members of staff, like two or three members of staff, walk about 10 patients off the ward do like a day area, like a little cafe on the unit where you can go and buy sweets and t-shirts and things like that. So the walkers, 10 patients, three members of staff, walkers to this cafe and I've saved up my money and I've put two layers of clothes on. Uh, we've gone to the shop and I thought, this is where I'm going to make me escape. So we've gone to the shop and that look, as we're coming round the corner, I've walked a little bit faster so I can like turn a little bit of a corner on the corridor. As soon as I turn the corridor on the corridor, I've just started running on this corridor. And I, I kept running, running, and I came to the reception of the psychiatric hospital. And then there was a field, and I run across the field, and then there was a member of staff that I knew that worked on the ward. I went like that, just shocked, and I just go whoosh, and just <laughs> ran straight past him, gone into uh, Northampton Town, oh. where I was. Uh, I think it was on Clasters, Wellerby Road. So, yeah, I'm going into all these places, don't even know where the hell I'm running, just wanting to go somewhere. And I thought, right, I need to get a taxi, taxi back to Yorkshire. From Northampton, it's just impossible, but that's what I thought at the time. I would catch a train station. So I ended up obviously running into all these places. I went into this pub, so I've caught my hair backwards, got my glasses out, put my glasses on, put a jumper on, tried to disguise myself, went to the bar, got myself a pint, <laughs> pint of lager, <laughs> seeing this guy having a game of pool. I went, can I have a game of pool with you? So I put my head down. As I'm putting my head down to have a game of pool, members of staff are running past the uh, pub window. And then they came into the pub. What member of staff went to the bar? I couldn't believe it. Hey, we hope you're enjoying the podcast. It's a word from our sponsor, Shady Rays, and it is the season of giving. Get the perfect gift for that special somebody, yourself or both. Our friends at Shady Rays have you covered with premium polarised shades and quick swap snow goggles that won't break the bank. Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that offers an unrivaled product that's just as good as any expensive pair we've worn. Durable frames and world-class optics for all outdoor adventures. And Jen's... Blonde locks aren't getting tangled. In the tangle-free nose piece, so I can put it up in my hair like this. <laughs> no catching. With an extensive array of styles and colours, you're bound to find the perfect pair of Shady Rays sunglasses. 
And if you're into winter sports, their quick swap snow lenses move effortlessly between full sun to low light environments. That's not all. Shady Rays offers the most insane protection in all of Iowa. Every pair of sunglasses is backed by lost or broken replacements. If you lose or break your pair, even on day one, they will send you a brand new pair, no questions asked. Exclusively for our listeners, Shady Rays is giving out a very merry deal for the season. Go to ShadyRays.com and use the code SHAUN for 50% off two plus pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over a quarter million people. That's ShadyRays.com, Sean, S-H-A-U-N, for 50% off or two more pairs of polarized sunglasses. Link in the description box if you're watching this on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Back to the podcast. Cheers. I thought, oh no, the obvious thing, because I'm disguised a little bit and I put my head down and I'm trying to take this pull shot with this mate. You know, you're you taking your time, mate. I, went, I know I'm just thinking about my shot. And the member of staff from the hospital is talking to the bar staff. He's looked over to me, the bar staff, but didn't say anything. The member of staff's gone out. I've gone up to the bar staff. I went, what's going on? He went, I know where you've just escaped from. You've just escaped from St. Andrew's Hospital, haven't you? I went, yeah. He went, I don't want no trouble in here. So I've turned around and said, you're not in here, but you better use the back exit now. So I've used the back exit. I went, thank you very much. Use the back exit. Start running on, the, uh, uh, on these roads. Police cars come down this road. I've run into this factory. People are saying, you can't come in here. I went, F off, F off. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Get out of my way. Get out of my way. And then the next thing, I've climbed up to this drain pipe. I've got like loads of pound coins and that lot uh, in my pockets and that lot. Uh, the police are chasing after me. And I've gone up to this like roof. Uh, and I couldn't get any more further on this roof because I had bad wire. I thought, oh, never. So I've like curled up into a ball, but like curled up where my back is and my head is onto the, on, on this, uh, this roof. So I'm just like crunched up. And I thought, and he, and he was on the walkie talkie saying, he's gone over, he's gone over, he's gone over, over the bad wire. And I thought, thank God they're going to go. And you won't believe this. It's just cliche, this. In my pocket, I had palm coins. Palm coins come out of my pocket, rolled on the roof. Rolled on the floor, the dogs are there, the police dogs and the police with the walkie talkies and palm coins are rolling off the roof and I thought, never. <laughs> and he went, I'm on, I'm on, he's here, we're still on the roof, he's still on the roof, he's, he's dropping money, he's dropping money. <laughs> I thought, never, it's just, it's, it's like comedy, but it's not comedy. Mm. And I thought, never, and he went, you better come down, you better come down, you better come down and we'll send the dog up and all that. So I thought, I'm not going to go nowhere, they've got me. So I stood up and went, yeah, I mean, he went, you got any weapons? I went, I've got no weapons. Come down, come down, they handcuffed me, took me back to the hospital, drip naked me, put me in seclusion room, and uh, the next day they put me back to court because they said I couldn't be in this hospital. And uh, I went to court and I explained everything. So did my mum. What happened in this hospital? Why I escaped? And I turned around and said, I've been sexually abused. I'm trying to get help from my mental health and all that lot and, you know, find out what's going on. I'm being sexually abused by this male member of staff. Just turned around and said, I don't know what to do with you. I mean, hands are tired. I really don't know. I don't want to send you back to the hospital. I said, I don't want to go back to the hospital and go through all that again. Uh, and he said, I don't know what to do. I went, send me back to prison. He went, send you back to prison. I went, yeah, send me back to prison. I'll go back to prison. So he sent me back to prison. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll uh, remand this case for four weeks and uh, I'll, I'll get you back in front of me. So I'm back in Doncaster prison on the healthcare. I go back to the jail. I go back to the, uh, I go back to the court and they just turned around and said, given the circumstances, what you've gone through, I want to give you a deferred sentence. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to release you now to the streets to go home. And I want you to try to prove to me with the help that you can stay out of trouble for six months. If you stay out of trouble, I'll give you a conditional discharge for the offences that you face, which is obviously the harassment, the assaults and the burglaries. Yeah. So I'm in the community and uh, that's when I met my baby mother, Michelle, in Leeds. And she gets pregnant. It's all happy days. And I tried to, I tried to turn my life around. I wanted to turn my life around because I've got this girl pregnant and I wanted to be a father. You know what I mean? I, my father could never be a father to me. And I wanted to be a better father than that. So I'm, 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 I'm taking you through the journey of how, how this is all starting. You can see the pattern, can't you, of the, how it is. So yeah, uh, I've gone to I've gone to her and I thought, well, I really want to make a, a good job of this. I want to get a job. I want to provide. I want to be a father. It was so difficult to get a job because I had conviction and I went to the probation services, even though I wasn't under the probation services. And I said, I need some help. I'd like you to try help me to get a job, please, because giving me convictions is difficult and my bad behaviour. Can you help me? And they turned around and went, 
why are you waiting? You're supposed to be in the hospital. They didn't even know that I was out. And I'm basically begging them, saying, I want you to help me. So they didn't know that I was out. They was angry. The social worker, the probation officer was angry. It was horrible. And she just always wanted to keep me locked up forever. And she couldn't, she said, we can't help you. You're not under the probation services. But this lady, this, this, this probation officer went on to do some further damage in my life. So I've gone back to Leeds and I'm living with my girlfriend. I'm trying to find a job. Next thing, we get a letter from, uh, from social services, Leeds Social Services. And they turn around and say, can you come up to, uh, can you come up to the uh, office? We want to talk to you about things. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, what's going on here? I'm not, I'm not a danger to children or anything like that. Because Michelle, uh, my, my, uh, my girlfriend at the time, had a two-year-old daughter, which I then took on as my stepdaughter because we were living as a relationship. I did see the biological farm and I spoke to her on a bus and I went, can I, can I adopt your daughter? Because you don't want to know her and all that. Like I said, yeah, but it was just from word of mouth. So basically, uh, I'm thinking, is someone like saying something around this area? What, what, what's going on? I'm getting paranoid on that lot. Anyway, I've gone up to social services with Michelle and I went, what's going on here? Well, why are we getting letters? What? And they turned around to Michelle and they went, do you know about his mental health history? Do you know that he's got a personality disorder? Do you know that he's a psychopath? But what? I went, hang on, she knows all about my mental health issues. She knows everything about me. And I went, what's this about? I went, I'm not a danger to children. I've never, I have no convictions against children. I would never harm a child. I went, I went, what, what are you trying to say? Are you try to say that I would hurt my stepdaughter. I went, I, she's, she's pregnant with my first child. So what's going on here? They were turning around and saying, well, we've got to do this. And I went, no, you're listening. You're not doing anything, man. Just leave us alone. I've done nothing. You've got nothing on me. I want my life. And I want to, you know, be, a, I want to make, a life for myself and a future, you know, just leave us alone. I've done nothing wrong. So anyway, me and Michelle are arguing and I just had this feeling inside me. I don't know what it was. I thought there's something not right. How this has all come about. I feel like they're going to like do something like tear us apart or something. I just had them instincts in me. So we've had a big argument. Michelle's gone to her mom's. I've gone around to where me and Michelle are staying by myself and I'm getting a bit depressed. I've had a can and I thought, oh, I better go say sorry to her. As I've come out of the house, Police fans are pulled up, and I thought, well, they're coming towards me. I thought, well, I ain't done anything, you know, I'm not. I said, can we, can we just have work? Can you just sit in here, please? I went, why, what? I ain't done anything. I'm under arrest. He said, can you just sit in this car with us? Sit in this car, and he went, where's Michelle? What's going on? I went, why? What's going on? You know, I, I, I didn't understand what was going on. Next thing, I see uh, an unmarked car pull up, and you won't believe who came out of the car. The people from the social services department saying, where's Michelle? Where, where has she gone on all that? Like, anyway, Michelle's come round the corner, See me in the police car, and I'm trying to get out of the police car. The social work woman's gone over there. Michelle's heavily pregnant. They leave him alone. He's done nothing wrong. She's crying. I went, listen, let me just go talk to her. She's pregnant. She's pregnant with our child. Please, she's in distress here. No, stay there. So what the social services said then, they've lied to me and said that Michelle's got an injunction order out and you're, you're going to have to go back to Hodgesfield, West Yorkshire, where your mum lives. So as I was going there, we had the old basic mobile phones then that were just normal phones for everybody. So she's phoned me on there. I went, what, what are you doing? You've got an injunction order out on me. She went, no, I haven't. I went, the, the social services is saying that you've got mental health problems and you could kill us and the hurt us and all this lot, even though there's no history. I've told them there's no history. I never have done, never will do. You've got no convictions, no history, no, no. I went, so what's happened? They went, they've took my stepdaughter and my mum and put them into safe houses. And they tried to put me in a safe house. And I went, no, he's done nothing wrong. I went, can, can we meet? She went, of course we can. So we met up and this was 1999 Christmas Eve. And it was absolutely devastating. Told me, mom, I was in tears. Uh, it was just, it's, you could see, it's just like all that. And then the social services do that to me. And you can see, it's, it's horrible. 1999, Christmas Eve. And it was going to be his first Christmas together as a family. I tried to make a life for myself. And then uh, what happened then? This is in the month of time. Like I told you, this is the only in the part of the 12 month that I was out. When you put it all together. The longest time that I was out was at that time, right at that time, which was probably a maximum of, what, six months, and then the rest was dribs and drabs on it. Six months, like one month there, one month there, three months there. And uh, so basically, got some stuff together. We went over to my mum's, me and Michelle, and I said, right, we'll fight in court, access, and get the kids back and, you know, sort everything out and all that lot because it's wrong list. So that's when uh, I got a solicitor involved and uh, I had to get an independent psychiatrist involved, which was Dr. Bob Johnson. Uh, the year 2000, which is now, what, 23 years now? Uh, it's about 23 years now, isn't it? 2000, yeah. And uh, Dr. Bob was 
uh, an independent psychiatrist and I explained everything to him. He looked at my history, talked to me. He turned around and he said that I can see no evidence of you ever hurting children. You've been separated from your own family. You've got deprivation from, obviously, a father seeing, a, you know, your child. That, that That's absolutely, you know, I think it would call parental deprivation, which is obviously the, I'm the father and they're separating us. And there was no substantial history to back up what they were saying. But it didn't just stop there. The hospital that I escaped from in St. Andrews, she's put a report into the social services and the court and the judge saying mm. it's a dangerous, untreatable psychopath and he needs to be assessed and locked up. He could hurt or harm, hypothetically. That's what they were saying, hypothetically. Could hurt and kill his family. And there were no evidence of it. So Dr. Bob, independent psychiatrist, saying, no, he's not a danger to children. No, he's not going to kill or hurt or harm his family. Instead, he wants to be there as a father to support his children. He, what, he tried to get a job and the probation declined him, didn't want to know. This, uh, and then obviously, so there was two psychiatrists in court battling against each other. You had Dr. Bob, the independent psychiatrist. Then you had obviously the uh, psychiatrist, which was in the hospital that I escaped from, and obviously she was protecting her staff because I made an allegation that one of her members of staff sexually assaulted me, which was true. And she's put a report in saying that he needs to be detained for a long time. His class is an untreatable psychopath and he needs to go to a place like Rampton. So Rampton then again was mentioned for the second time in my life at that time. Uh, so I'm, I'm in a community. I'm trying to find access with court uh, and that lot. I've lost access to me by uh, to my stepdaughter so i've got my biological daughter i'm fighting access to be, to, to be at the birth of my daughter the judge turned around in the court at least court family courts and said you can't attend the birth of your child so i thought that was good news so i can attend the birth of my child so michelle's rung me and said i'm in labor hurry up so i've raced over from Odisfield, west Oaks, where i would live in with my family and friends um mom's dropped me off i've gone into uh, the reception and they turned around and said uh, I said, where's the maternity ward? I'm at my girlfriend's in labour. He went, hang on, what's your name? I went, what do you mean, what's my name? I went, hang on, my girlfriend's in labour. Can you tell me where the maternity ward is, please? I've had a phone call, she's in labour right now. Uh, they turned around and said, you're not allowed here. I went, what? I, I went, what are you on about? I'm not allowed here. I went, yeah, I am. And I started kicking off and threatening staff and that. Lot. I said, I am, what are you on about? The judge said, I can turn up to the birth and everything like that. So I'm ringing up solicitors and everything like that. The police had to be called. There was loads of police vans. They came for me and they were saying, we're going to have to escort you off the premises. I went, why? We're being told, they're being told that you're not allowed to come. I went, I've been told by the judge I can obviously attend the birth of my child. I went, what are you saying? I can't. Why? What, what's going on? So I was devastated. I was breaking down. I was in tears. I tried to phone solicitor. I tried to get them involved. It wasn't happening. Three hours later, I get a phone call and... It's Michelle, and she said, I hear that you were trying to get into hospital. It's, it's heartbreaking, you know what I mean? And you know, I couldn't be there to the birth of my daughter, man. Proper heartbreaking, you know what I mean? And Michelle turned around, she went, I heard you try getting in, but the police refused you. Yeah. And she said, we've, we've got a little girl, Chloe. I'm just... It just got me so angry. And the authorities doing that to me. Ten days ago, I was at the birth of my own child, and I understand the importance of that and how heartbreaking that must have been for you. It's horrendous. It was. Even after I've never done anything to any children, ever, to this day, and not once. Uh, so, so social services then, in court, I told them you were wrong, and... Did you promise me I could turn up the birth? And they were carrying on with court proceedings. You just didn't bother. There were no support from me whatsoever. Nothing. They didn't want to know. Nothing. Uh, they didn't say, well, do this course, do a, do a healthy relationship course or a, you know, a, a family course. They just didn't do anything. It was, it was devastating. I turned to drink. I turned to drugs. Uh, they turned around to Michelle and said, you've got to make a choice. You have to stay with and don't see your kids. And Michelle said, I don't know what to do. I just said, stay with the kids because the kids are going social. And I know what happens in, you know, they're going to care and all that. Like, just stay with the kids. I'll keep on fighting. We'll, we'll be together one day. Don't you worry. We'll fight. I'll keep on fighting. And we kept on seeing each other behind the social services. Back it was like Rome and Juliet. We loved each other, but they tore us apart. They tore us apart. We, we proper, proper loved each other. It was devastating. I tried to make a life. I, I know I'd done wrong things, but I tried to, I tried, you know what I mean? Uh, and that was that. And we, we, we lost contact. They, they moved Michelle around in safe houses with a baby, and I, I didn't know where she was. Uh, and I was drinking, taking drugs. I met someone else. And... I don't know what happened. It, it became so 
I think I was just looking for comfort. I met this girl called Rachel, and she felt pregnant. She felt so pregnant, so easy. It was just like two or three months. I, I don't know what it was. It's, I was looking for comfort because I was... I lost access to my kid. I didn't know with me head, but my head was totally battered. And I, I, I don't know what it was. I just leant on this woman for comfort and she fell pregnant straight away within a month. It was, it was just shocking. And I told her, she knew all about what happened with Michelle. And I know I so desperately wanted to be a father. You don't understand. And I had to do something again, which is not good again. It's not good. And let me explain to you, it's devastating. It's, it, it's not on the same lines as obviously my first offence that I committed, but it's, it's wrong. And I wanted to be a father, and I didn't want Rachel to go through what Michelle went through with the social services. And I was devastated because there's so much I wanted to be a father, as you just, you know I do. And we talked about abortion, and it killed me. It was like killing my own baby, you know, aborting my own baby, our baby. And so much I wanted to be a dad. But I couldn't let her go through that. She, I, she, I said, no, because social services get involved. I, I just, I didn't know what to do. I was, this 19-year-old this kid just wanting to be so desperately to be a father. And she had an abortion. I took her to the clinic and I was devastated. And I was in this clinic of this abortion clinic in Manchester. And I was crying and I just didn't want her to do it. And then she came down and it happened. and. Sorry, Look, when I hold my little baby, it's just pure love, and that is the most important thing in the world, and I understand exactly how you feel, man. Wanted to be a dad. So bad. Oh, yeah, me. But worse and worse. And I went out drinking with Rachel, and she went, come on. I went, I can't, I don't know. My head's all over the place. We just no bored our baby. You know, it's devastating. And went out drinking, drowned my sorrows like you do. And I went out drinking and uh, she was driving and I needed a pee behind the back of this house. And I seen this tarry cotton plant pot and I thought of all those dress that I've put my mum through. That'd be nice for that. I stole it. This big tarry cotton plant pot with some flowers in it. I put it in the car. Next thing, this guy's come out and said, give me my neighbor's plant pot back. And I'm thinking... in what plant pot and he said they one in the car so I got it threw it in the car and I've got a couple of Olsen Pills bottles in, in the car that I've been drinking and that lot and I wound the window down and he's like mouthing at me and he's saying you know shouting at me and then he's tried grabbing my shirt in the car window then get out get out so he's provocating me so I'm thinking you know this this guy I didn't know he was a truck driver at the time he was in his 50s but he was a big charber and I'm just some little 19 year old little skinny little rig and he's grabbing me out, and next thing, I thought, I just can't be doing with this. So I've got older, one of the Austin Pills bottles full of beer, and I've pushed open the door, and he's fell on the floor. I've gone round to the side of the car, and I've smashed the glass bottle. So I've got the end of the glass bottle, the Austin Pill bottle in my hand. And he's just coming at me. And I've tried to threaten him, saying, stay away. And he just, I don't know if he did see it, or whatever. So I've got this broken bottle in my hand, and he's just coming at me. So I'm just like moving him, and swinging this out like a sword. And I'm hitting him with it, but he's still coming at me and he's grabbing hold of me. Then help, 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 help. And I, he just like won't let go. And I was just like sticking him, sticking him, sticking him, stabbing him, stabbing him all over his body. I ended up stabbing him about 16 times in his face, in his body, in his arms, in, in, all over his body. And he had pieces of glass still in his face. And I severed his glands and his face and his eye. He had like a patch around his eye where he stabbed the bottle. But it was pretty bad forensic attack. And I just, at that time, I just, it wasn't him that I was attacking. I know it wasn't him. This guy was an innocent guy trying to protect his neighbor's plant pot, or as you would call it, an Avago hero. The anchor was directed at the social services and the psychiatrist at the time. I'm so sorry to say this, but he shouldn't have got it. It should have been them. My attack shouldn't have been on this innocent guy trying to protect his neighbor's plant pot. 
my anger should have been directed at that because that's where it was. That's where the rage was. And, it, and it, it's probably even more, goes way back, it was probably all the rage from the childhood, the abuse, and it all comes together. And it comes as an explosion where I've just had enough. It's like, and it's just like blanking out, blank, 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 blank. The next thing I've seen him, like, he's just let go. And I've had this like blank thing, like, like a blackout thing. And I've just like, and I've stood up and he's like on the floor. And I didn't know, it's just with that blackout, with the first ever blackout that I had, and I've got this broken bottle in me, and I've stabbed him and he's on the floor, and I've just ran, and I took the bottle and gone and left him. And next morning, police have surrounded me and my girlfriend, arrested me on a Section 18 malicious wound with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. Uh, that is, is one of the, well, it is the serious, it is the most serious offence on my criminal conviction sheet to show. Uh, They've, the police have arrested me on other various offences, which obviously you, you've seen paperwork on, where burglaries, in possession of a firearm, uh, Section 18, but they've come to no further action where there's been no physical evidence. Uh, the most serious offence on my criminal conviction sheet is receiving a six-year sentence for the crime of Section 18 malicious wounding with intent to cause with respect to the arm. I was 19 year old. At first, I pleaded not guilty, and I did this for a reason, because I knew that the mental health services, because I've got mental health, and I know if you go to court, as you, as anyone knows who's got criminal convictions, you get a pre-sentence report. They do a pre-sentence report, which means they go right back into your history. So I thought, on the first day of trial, I thought, if the, if the, what they're going to do to me, because Rams has been mentioned quite a few times, they're going to try and get me to go there. Mm. They'll probably try to section me, and, and that's it, it's game over, I'm never going to get out. So I thought about it, I thought very cleverly, and I thought, right, what I'll do, on the first day of trial, I told my uh, barrister and solicitor, I said, right, what I'll do is I'll plead guilty today on the first day of trial, but I want to be sentenced immediately today without a pre-sentence report. And I thought, if I can get, if I can get that done, which it's a, it's a nominee, in a way, it's, it's bargain, but it's a manipulation. So I'm telling the barrister and solicitor that they work for you. So I'm telling them my plan, this is what the plan is, to ask the judge if he'll sentence me today without a pre-sentence report. If I get a pre-sentence report, it will talk about all my mental health history and it will turn around from the other psychiatrist that lost me my kid, turns around and says, I'm classed as an untreatable psychopath, I need to be then in Rampton Hospital for a very long time. I knew that would come in, so I wanted to avoid that pre-sentence psychiatric report. So the judge, uh, the, the judge accepted it at Leeds Crown Court. The judge turned around and said, yeah, uh, I've been talking with you, Barrister, and I'm quite happy to sentence you today immediately without the pre-sentence report. I do not know any history of your of your background or anything to do with you, uh, but I know that you tried to go self-defense, but you have took it too far with a broken bottle. I know that you lost access to your, your, your child, and I know that I probably have a contributing factor to it. That is all I've, that's the only information I've got. And for this crime, I'm still said I'll probably get about four, four and a half. He said, for this crime, and that you're pleading guilty on the first day of trial, and when I sent you to six years of a friend's institution, and out of that six years, I ended up doing a full nine and a half years out of that. So I'm doing time. I just want to be left alone. I thought, right, I've done the, I've done the crime. I'm going to do the time now. So I'm in Doncaster Prison, sorting myself out, uh, try to get on with my time, do a, a few uh, friendly behaviour courses, and uh, end up back in a bit of a relationship with these female members of staff, uh, doing, a, doing anger management course. And it was all good. I thought everything were laughing and that lot. And uh, I got on with this female member of staff, pretty mad actually. And uh, and then I'll tell you first name. My name was Stacey. She was the one who was running the offender behavior courses. At the end, I would help out and clear up at the end. We got really talking on that lot, and it was all right. And uh, we started to personal questions about each other, sending like lovely love letters to each other. And I said, I, I, when I get out, you know, you're kind of all right. We get together and things like that. So she wasn't like a, a prison officer as such. She was working for the prison system, but running offender behavior courses in the prison. So anyway, it was all good and that lot. And I told one person on the wing in, in jail that I'm seeing this, obviously, this, this, this obviously officer who runs the offender behavior courses in the education department in jail. And he said, spot on, spot on. So I'm showing him love letters and all that lot. It's all been good and that lot. Anyway, all of a sudden, not he hadn't, he hadn't said nothing. So a couple of months down the line, we're, we're, it's all been good. We're seeing each other. We're having sex in the, in the cleaning cupboard and things like that. And we're always seeing each other down the education department. I became a trustee cleaner down the education department. So it was all good. So I was seeing it quite often. Uh, anyway, a member of staff 
down the education department that they, they, they became a bit concerned that we was always together as a trustee prisoner. So they, anyway, they, they done a search of my cell and they found the love letters. Mm. So next thing, I've gone to the wing PO office, which is the general manager's office, and they turned around and as soon as I've gone in, they've got all the love letters all over the desk, all over the desk. And he went, can you explain this? I can't. <laughs> I said, I can't. He went, how long has it been going on? I don't know, about three months. He said, uh, it's a major security breach here. Yeah, she's, she's been suspended and you're going to be transferred out of our jail. Uh, I know that jails get the different names, uh, so they transferred me. But then, HMP Hull, obviously, different jails get different names, like it's a non jail and this. HMP Hull was classed as a normal jail where they send bad people for breaching security. This is back in... Uh, let me go back uh, how many years? So, uh, 2000, 2001. So, so they transferred me there due to security breach. Uh, and whilst I was there, uh, I had to go up, up to the healthcare. Uh, so I got transferred for breach of security for having a relationship with a, f- a female member of staff in Doncaster Prison. They transferred me to HMP Hall. Whilst I was in HMP Hall, I had to go up to the healthcare and a psychiatrist, prison psychiatrist, came to assess me. So I've gone up to the healthcare and he said, Yes, I'm, I'm a prison psychiatrist and I've come to assess you uh, for your personality disorder. I went, listen to me. I went, I don't want to see you. I don't want nothing to do with you. I went, I've had all that on the outside. You've lost me, my kid, all that lot. I don't want nothing to do with you. Just leave me alone. Let me get on with my time. And that's it. That's it. And I'm walking away. So I left it. I don't want nothing to do with you. So I've gone out. Gone, as I've gone back to Wing, uh, I've gone back to Wing and uh, the SO, senior officers, turned around and said, Tell me, where were you? I said, yeah. I said, you just come back from healthcare, haven't you? He said, I've just come back. I've, I've just come off the phone to uh, a doctor and I'm going to have to put you in a single cell. I went, why? He went, because you've got mental health problems and your personality disorder and that you could be a danger to other inmates, uh, your cellmate. I went, what? I went, why are you doing this? I was padded up with someone. I went, why are you doing this to me? I went, just, I, went, I, went, I told him to leave me alone. He said, well, I've got to do this because this is what we're being told. And they would, they would like, coming on the wing and talking to me and wanting to, you know, pressure me and just like goading me, intimidating me. And I thought, I, I can't do this anymore. And then that's when I started doing the dirty protests, smashing up, threatening staff. Then they wrapped me up. Then they put me down the block. And that was the time and the turning point of that prison sentence on tour against the authorities. It would not stop. So then I, I smash up, I threaten, I go down the block, you know, get the right squad. The right squad will come in smash me up, bust me up, put me in seg, smash up my toilet, smash up my sink. So it'd be like constantly doing that. I'd be breaching security, trying to get glass, threatening them with glass, making weapons. Uh, so I make weapons uh, just to get transferred to different jails. Tried to settle down in these jails, but I couldn't settle down in any of these jails that I were transferring. They were sending me on 28-day laydowns. I was on the uh, Group 4 buses up and down the country, traveling to different uh, jails. The Home Office were getting involved. That jail wouldn't accept me because of my security breaches. That jail wouldn't. You know what it's like when you're going on the merry-go-round on a 28-day lay down, going to Durham, going there, going there, up and down, going strange ways. I was going to all these different prisons on 28-day lay downs. And I, I just couldn't settle. And then obviously I eventually got to Walton, Liverpool jail, and said, this is the last bus stop. You're not going nowhere else. You, this, is, this is it. We'll keep you and you won't go to any other jail. I remember when I was in Garth, smashed up there, and that's when they transferred me to Walton, Liverpool. And the psychiatrist became involved in, 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 in my life then because the Mufti squad were beating me up because we were smashing it. The, but they would, they'd go too far, you know, they'd smash your face up and that lot just for smashing the sink and toilet up, for Christ's sake, you know what I mean? The Mufti squad would they'd really go to town on you, you know, proper seriously assault you, seriously beat you to death near enough. And I turned around and said, well, it was him that done that. I go into adjudication room to go. And I went, well, he, he done that. He smashed me. He, there were no need that. There were no need for that. I went, I tell you what, when I get out, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to eat you. I'm going to eat your family. And I just saying these angry things again because of what the prison system was goading me and all that lot. So again, uh, a psychiatrist became involved looking through my medical files and they came across, obviously, the psychiatrist report. Dr. Bob's report was there, but they didn't want to listen to Dr. Bob's report. They just want to listen to the bad report, which is, this guy's dangerous, psychopath, personality disorder, Rampton. So this doctor came involved, and she was saying, uh, yeah, we think that you would be suitable to a place to go to. I went, Rampton. I went, Rampton? Rampton, Maximum Security? I went, nah, I, went, I don't need to go there. I'm not, I'm not that serious. I went, his child killers in there, rapists, murderers, pedophiles. I went, I don't fit any of that criteria. I don't even belonging to maximum security 
well, you know, your behavior is showing otherwise and, you know, you've got personality disorder and you won't engage with authorities. So that was that. Anyway, I ended up going to uh, Liverpool Walton Block and my behavior started escalating there because they just won't leave me alone. I ended up on the healthcare and I thought, well, if they think I'm mad, then I might as well act mad. So I just started, my behaviour just started deteriorating. I think my mental health was seriously deteriorating. And I wasn't hearing voices, but my mental health was deteriorating. And I thought, I don't know, I've got talking to this guy in the healthcare and the hatches. You've got two hatches on the healthcare. Come down the corridor, you've got your cell door there and you can sell door there. And you both your hatches are down and you can talk to prisoners across each other. And obviously when you're in jail and you can you know, pass tobacco or Sometimes you can pass the back or across to each other. You can turn around and say, miss or boss, when they're coming around the prison officers and say, listen, can you do me a favor? Just put that burn on the middle because I'm stressed. And on the healthcare, they will do. On the wings, they're very reluctant to because it could be like drugs or anything like that. So anyway, I got talking to this guy across from me. He was a prolific self-armor. He was on his way to get sectioned. He wanted to get sectioned. I didn't. So that was the difference. And he was like cutting himself up to death and that lot, putting razor blades in his skin, in his uh, penis. And he would like to go to hospital and, you know, like the, you know, surgically remove razor blades from his penis or inside his skin. So the guy was off his edge, you know what I mean? And I thought, anyway, I, I just had a bit of a fascination of cannibalism and things like that. So I got talking to him uh, and I said to him, I don't know why I did. I said, listen, what's it like? Uh, I wonder what it's like for, to taste uh, your flesh. You know, you keep cutting yourself up and that lot. I said, you give me some? He went, yeah. I went, really? You, you could eat it? I went, yeah, I'll eat it. I'll just try it out just as a lot. I think my mental health was deteriorating at that stage. <laughs> So he's cut two pieces of slash of his skin off, you know, proper into it, thick way. You've got the, the gristle apart <laughs> into it. He's cut it off and he's washed it. And put, I said, wash it and put it in the tissue. And I'll tell him, obviously, one of the bosses that passed me tobacco. So anyway, this female nurse is wrong again. Female nurses come up and basically you just doing me a favor. Just pass me that tobacco, please. She went, yeah, 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 yeah. Pass me that tobacco. It's wrapped up in tissue. Got the tissue. And uh, I went, mister, you know what it is? I went, yeah, it's burn tobacco. I went, no, it's not. I went, what? And I don't know, I was just having a laugh. I went, look, miss. I opened it up in front of her and she went, what's that? I went, it's his flesh. I went, what? I went, he's cut, his, he's cut his flesh off. I'm going to eat it. I went, you think I'm mad? So I might as well act mad then, eh? Well, I, I started chewing it. was chewing it. <laughs> so I started chewing it. <sighs> I started eating it. She blew on a whistle, stuck in running on the corridor. <laughs> So what's going on? What's going on? She went, it's, 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 it's. She couldn't get a word. So it's just eating his flesh. <laughs> and obviously they took it. They put me in the office and said, "What's going on?" And that lot. And I went, "Well, if he's stupid enough to cut his, you know, effing flesh off, you know, I wanted to taste it. Why? I went, what? Why? You think I'm mad? You sectioned me. You want him to go to Ramsden? So why not? I just want to know what it tastes of. You know, the guy's stupid enough to. And they turned around and said, "Right, we're gonna have to put you down the block." I went, "Why? You went, you're a danger to other prisoners." I went, "How?" He went, because you're asking other prisoners to cut their flesh off so you can eat it. I went, so if he's stupid enough to do it, then it's not, it's not my fault. He went, right, you've been segregated. Put me on JRD, good order and discipline. Down the block I went in Walton, and I remained down the block for about eight months. <laughs> so, yeah, they, 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 I were down there. They wouldn't let me go back on the wing. They wouldn't do nothing with me. That's when Rampton came, and they said, uh, you're going to come with us. And I went, no, I'm not coming nowhere. He said, well, if you don't, we'll put you in a rubber jacket. This was six weeks before my prison release day. Uh, that I was going to be released. So I would have been released at a six year sentence, you do two thirds, which is four years. So I've done three years, 10 months. So I nearly done four years and then I would have been released, released on license for two years. So 10 weeks before my prison release date, they said you've been rubber stamped by the Home Office. You're coming to us, Rampton, uh, and you're going to go on uh, the Personal Disorder Directory Services. There's two units. There's the DSPD system, which is the Dangerous Severe Personal Disorder, but you don't fit criteria for that. You fit the criteria for the personality disorder directory services because you suffer from a personality disorder. So uh, I said, I'm not going there. So anyway, I told my mom, she went, just go there. I know you're going to still get released. I still had, me, I still had it in my head that I'm going to get released in six, six weeks' times. I, I, I didn't know. Well, I did know about Ramsden, but I, I thought in my head, I thought, well, no, they're going to release me. I'm not, I, I'll just refuse to engage and they won't do no, and then I'll get released in six weeks' times. That's what I had in my head. Little did I know that didn't happen. So when I got there on the first day of going to Rampton Hospital, they put me on the white van. They took me there with members of staff from Rampton Hospital. And then there was about three members of staff that were walking me around the ward, telling me about it. And they were trying to sell it, man. They said, we've got swimming pools in here. We, we've got uh, 
games. Uh, you get benefits of £57 a week in here. Try to read this. I don't want to. I'm not interested in your money in your swimming pools. I don't even want to be in a maximum security hospital. I don't want to be wrapped up with all your nutters and your murderers and, your and all your bitches and all that lot. I said I'm getting out in six weeks' time. So that's all I kept saying. They said, no, you weren't going to be here for a long time. I didn't really take it in what they were saying. Uh, and six weeks uh, came and I said, right, I'm ready to go home. Thought, you're not going home. Psychiatrist said, really sorry to say this. You're staying with us. You could be staying with us for a very long time. We need to assess you and treat you for your ongoing personality disorder. And that's when I thought, nah, I'm not doing it. I started talking to people and then I said, I've been in here 10 years, 20 years, 40 years. I started crapping myself. I thought, no way. I went, this is, this is good. You know, what's going on here? It, it, me, me, it was all over the place. So that's when I started getting my solicitors involved and started saying, well, what, what, you know, how am I going to get out? I said, you know, how long's a piece of string? And that's all I was getting, you know, from my solicitors. And I, I started rebelling against the system, started threatening the staff, and that's when I started what, being on a wall path. I heard some psychiatrists turn around and say that I was untreatable. Because personality disorders, I like sort of classed as untreatable. You can't treat personality disorders. And some psychiatrists that's interviewed me before have said I'm untreatable. Dr. Bob has been throughout the journey with me where I've told him and I've told him that I'm untreatable, even though I did benefit from his therapy. I did benefit because he's the one that didn't want to lock me up. He's the one who wanted to help me. He's the one who wanted me to live a stable life in the community. His therapy worked. Other psychiatrists, they just want to lock you up, throw away the key. They're not interested in anything else. That's all there is. Protecting the public, protect number one, protect the public. And that's all that the, the other psychiatrists, psychologists that have ever come into my life, that's all they were concerned about. Not what Dr. Bob offered, which was truth, trust, and consent. Truth, trust, and consent, which is you tell the truth, consent, you consent to get it, tell him, open up, and obviously you trust him. You trust him with your life, you trust him. And I turned around to him and I said, Listen, if I tell you what's happened in my life, will you turn around? Can you promise me and guarantee you're not just going to lock me up and throw away the key? And he turned around and said, I'm not here to do that. I'm here to assess you, assess your, your dangerousness, assess this, assess that. He was a proper psychiatrist. He did it by the book. And that's what I liked about him. These other psychiatrists, they're just dangerous. They just don't listen. The, psychi the psychiatrists that I've uh, been talking to, they need to take a leaf out of Dr. Bob, Dr. Bob's book and how he addresses other patients because his therapy works. The other people, it doesn't. Uh, so anyway, I kept up this, again, lying about voices, getting medicated, getting depot injections in Rampton. So I, it was always, they called it a rapid tranquilization then, but it was still the depot injections, threatening the staff on a daily basis. And because uh, they weren't letting me out, and they were saying that, you, that you, the only time that you can get out is on a mental health review tribunal, which is an M MHRRT, classed as an appeal or going through a parole process in prison so it's classed as that and you sit in front of a board and you try to demonstrate that you saved it but the problem with me is i was refusing to engage i was claiming that i was untreatable when i got a psychiatrist saying i was untreatable before i thought i started to study what the mental health was about and who i was and what they're trying to do about me so i started to become cleverer and trying to understand the loopholes the legal loopholes under the mental health services how to avoid them how to play them how to just just how to how basically how to play the system or i tried to beat the system and i thought if you class as untreatable then you can't be detained on a mental health at 1983 anyway in any hospital because you class as untreatable that's what i had that's what my thought was my thought process and obviously i told other patients in there and they were saying that you're just untreatable so you're going to be talking a long time when, once you're in this place, you're not getting out. They're going to keep me. And I didn't know this. I was playing with fire. So eventually, I started to get a bit scared. And I, I thought, right, I better tell them the truth about not hearing voices. Listen to this one. You'll, you'll laugh at this one. It's incredible. So I talked to Mr. psychiatrist and I turned around to him and I said, hey, listen, I need to talk to you about something. I, mean, I know you've got all my history about hearing voices and things like that, and mental illness and that lot, yeah? So I've got stroke mental illness, stroke personality disorder. I went, right, I need to tell you, I've never, ever her voices in my entire life. It was all a lie from my stepfather. I went, this has got too far now. This has gone too deep. I'm in a maximum security hospital and I'm not getting out. You can imagine what's going on. It's like the boy who cried wolf. And I turned around and I went, I don't hear voices, never have done. And he went, this is what it is. This is what I believe. He went, I believe that you have heard voices and that you're possibly hearing voices now. I went, 
I, I swear to God, I would swear. I went, you effing what? I went, I smashed your head in. And I went to go to, to attack him like that. Next thing, Stafford grabbed me, pinned me down. I couldn't even tell him the truth. They gave me a depot injection. And it was like an emotional one. I was crying on this medication. I didn't even know what they gave me. I told Dr. Bob. He, he got angry and phoned up the hospital and talked to the psychiatrist. Why are you giving him that? I was I, 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 I crying on this medication. I don't know what they gave me, but they gave me a depot injection in my eyes. So they went, look what you're doing to me. You're making me cry and I can't stop crying. Or what? I, can't, I, don't know, I don't know what they gave me. Cry, cry medication. But yeah, it was, I don't know. It was absolutely, it was, it was off the rails. But what, what was absolutely devastating is I tried to tell the psychiatrist that I don't hear voices, never have done, and he didn't believe me. So they still think I hear voices, even to this day. I, I've still got these diagnoses floating around that I'm, that I'm on medication for hearing voices that I never heard. I've been jabbed up, I've been on medication for the past 15 years, I've been zombie for 15 years for pretending to hear voices when I've never heard not one voice. All that medication for nothing. All them jabs in my ass for nothing. Incredible. Uh, so yeah, uh, so my behaviour started to escalate, and then what's happened then is uh, I did something wrong. I did, I did, I did a breach of security in there. They turned around and said, "If you behave yourself, we'll give you a TV." So they gave me a TV. I didn't want to behave myself. I still wanted to protest, and uh, I turned my TV around, smashed, I put it in my blanket, smashed it, and I got about twenty pieces of glass out of it. I know it was wrong. Uh, but I just wanted to breach security. I wanted to make the staff pay in there because they were being horrible. They were twisting me up. They were restraining me. They were assaulting me. They wasn't helping me. They didn't want to help me. They'd be just these psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers come up and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. We'd like to do assessment. I said, F off, I'm untreatable. And uh, that's, that's the way it was going. So anyway, I've got these pieces of glass. I've hid them all around the wards. And I've given, because I, I knew what I was doing. I know it's wrong. But yeah, I know it's in maximum security, giving shards of glass to serial killers, nonsers, murderers, cannibals. I met a cannibal in there. It was, it was quite interesting. Uh, and yeah, I, anyway, I gave, I gave this piece of glass to this health farmer. I knew that he was going to give it to a member of staff. I knew what I was doing, yeah. I knew he wasn't going to kill himself. But he could have. He could have killed himself or a member of staff. It was pretty crazy. So I've hid pieces of glass all around the ward. There's about 10 of us on the ward, patients, and about loads of members of staff. So I've gone around hiding loads of big shards of glass of all over and that lot. And I've obviously gave this, obvious, this other patient a piece of glass. He's handed it into members of staff. Next thing, loads of staff have swooped me in my bedroom and that lot. Said, what, 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 you know, what, what's going on? Apparently, you gave this patient a piece of glass. Where's it come from? My TV was turned to the wall. And I turned my TV around and they had no glass in the TV. All the glass was taken out. He went, what? where's all the glass? Where's all the glass? I went, it's round the, the wall. Next thing, padding button's been pressed. Padding button, all the staff have come. They turned around and said, we have to evacuate the whole ward. There was a new ward that was getting built and it was all full of dust. So they had to put all the new patients on this dusty ward that was not being opened yet, that was still closed. So they could get someone specialist in to get all the pieces of glass that I've obviously done. Because they said, where have you put them? I went, I'm not telling you. So yeah, it caused loads of problems where some people came in from outside to go find all these shrouds of glass and clear the whole ten embedded ward. I thought they want to play about with me. I'll play about with them. I'll make these members of staff work for their ass and work for the pennies. Because what they were doing to me and other, pa other mm -hmm. patients in there was absolutely disgusting and wrong. They threatened us, they'd intimidate us, they'd pull us out of his bed in the morning to do treatment and therapy. I wasn't doing any of it. So uh, what they've done then, then they turned around and said, uh, Right, we're going to put you uh, down Derwent Ward, uh, where all the other mentally ill patients are. Derwent Ward is a two-bedded ICU unit. And I went, what's the ICU? I thought ICU was something in like healthcare, like in a, in a hospital, like someone's near enough dying. That's what I thought intensive care unit was. And I thought, well, I'm not dying. So I didn't know what intensive care unit was at the moment. But, I, you know, I thought, right, fair enough. I'll go there then. So members of staff handcuffed me, took me down, loads of members of staff. And next thing, I, I go into this, like, room. It's like a, a cell within a cell. And I turn around and went, what's, what, what's this? He went, you're going to be staying in here until we can assess you, until we know what we're doing with you. So they open this, like, metal door, and it's got a hatch on it. And I go into one room. It's got, like, a, a blue mattress. And then, obviously, it's got a hatchway and a camera above it. You go into that room, and then you're, in another room, you've got cardboard furniture, a cardboard chair, a cardboard hat that you can in and a TV that's bolted to the ceiling and then another metal door with a hatch. So uh, I, I, I turn around and went, so it's, it's like your own little accommodation, but it's classed as your cell. Cell within a cell, basically. 
Uh, so I said, what, what's this? And they went, this is called the intensive care unit. Uh, it's basically for the most dangerous disturbed prisoners patients that we've got in our hospital. You, you're too dangerous to be around other patients and members of staff because you put pieces of glass all over the unit and they could have attacked us and killed us or killed others or killed themselves or whatever. So it's classed as a major security breach. So I thought, well, fair enough, I'm not bothered because I'm, I'm untreatable. <laughs> That's all I thought, I'm untreatable and I'm not bothered. I'll cause as much fuss as possible. So yeah, that was that was that. It's comical, but it's not comical because it's just you know I'm still detained in this maximum security hospital, thinking I'm never going to get out, and all I keep thinking about is just out, out, out. I want to be out there. I want to go see my daughter. I want to be there, and I'm still getting this in my head. And the only thing that's keeping me alive and my sanity and my sense is my sense of humour. And one day of believing that I will see my daughter one day, fighting to see my daughter because I loved her. What I want, I still love her, and. I, I, I'll get to my daughter eventually. And uh, so, yeah. So whilst I'm in there, they were taking me out to the exercise. They were feeding me through the hatch. And uh, whilst I was in this ICU, uh, they turned around and said, uh, do you know who was in this, in this uh, unit before me? And I looked and I went, no, I went, but it's dirty in here. I went, yeah, it's, I said, it's full of cobwebs and everything like that. I said, can I not clean it? Did you can clean it. Uh, I went, when was the last person who was in here? They went, Ian Huntley. I went, who? They went, Ian Huntley, we, uh, they, he came here for assessment. I, I did look it up on that lot after when I got out on that lot, but yeah, it was all right, because the members of staff were telling me. They went, yeah, Ian Huntley. I went, Ian Huntley, who killed all the and Jessica Wells, the two girls? I went, what was he in it for? They went, well, I can't say much, because you remember staff were talking to me outside the door, talking to me, because they've got like a clipboard. There's two members of staff, or one, and they're like watching me through the door. So I'm making conversation, talking to them, because I'm bored. I'm lonely, and I just want to talk to someone because it's just talking to four walls otherwise. So they've got this clipboard, and they're just writing everything down that I do. Have, have, you know, have a crap, have a wee, talk about rubbish, talk about this. And uh, they, they were telling me, and saying, yeah, in, Ian Utley was in your cell. We had to assess him. We had to isolate him away from other prisoners. This is, you, there's no prisoners around here. You can see that. I went, yeah. I went, where are they? He went, they're on the next ward. This is a unit on its own called Derwent Ward. Uh, and they turned around and said, yeah, people like Ian Lutley was held here. We assessed him. He was classed as sin. He went back to prison. Charlie Bronson's been there. I went, oh, Charlie Bronson's been on here. I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went, he, he's, I, I went I've got the same psychiatrist as him. And, uh, and I, I, he was in Wakefield in uh, the cage down there with uh, another prisoner called Robert Moores there. Uh, and uh, I, I got talking to Dr. Bob then, and he turned around, and he was the one to, to suggest. He said, well, why don't you write to Charlie? He probably can help you with things like that. So I wrote to Charlie Bronson. He'll tell you himself. So I wrote to Charlie Bronson whilst I was in Rampton Hospital, on Derwent Ward, because I could have pen and paper, but it was like a plastic one, a plastic pen and all that lot, and I have to watch it, and they'd have to watch it in front of me to write it, because I'm allowed to write mail out to family and friends and solicitors. But as soon as I've finished writing it, I've got to give it them. I've got to put it through the hatch. And they send it out. So I wrote to Charlie Bronson at uh, Love Lane, uh, HMP Wakefield, and he wrote back to me. So I told him all about Dr. Bob and all that lot. I said, we've got the same psychiatrist. And I said, and he turned around and he wrote and he sent a couple of cartoons in his, in his letter. And he says, uh, yes, I was on Derwent Ward so many years ago. He went, I was in that hell place uh, and they left me there to rot. What you need is a good solicitor uh, and Dr. Bob and they will do everything in their power to get you out. You've just got to keep focused and believe in yourself. So, again, it was all good. And I think he was saying other things uh, to do with that uh, in Derwent. And, yeah, it was, I think he said something about doing a rooftop protest. And it, it was hell all in there. He just kept saying hell all in his letter. And uh, I wrote back to him and I said, thank you very much. Yeah, I said, I've got good solicitors. Robert Moore, Nicholas Jones, solicitors on the Met Health Act. And it was spot on. Alan Aislers, he was spot on. One of the best solicitors in the Liverpool area, I think. It was good for me. I don't know if you heard of him or know him. No. But yeah, he's spot on. And uh, I'll tell you, because it helps me. Uh, so yeah, I got a good solicitor and Dr. Bob. And we got talking about other things. Uh, and whilst I was in my cell, cell within a cell, I just kept on thinking of escape. That's all you think about, you know, escape, escape, escape. So I'm in this cell within a cell. So this cell on Derwent Ward, cell within a cell, the ICU, is the most secure part in Rampton Hospital itself. There is another part, which is called the DSPD, which I'm going to get to, which is the new unit, which is held untreatable psychopaths. So I'm on the main part of Rampton Hospital, and it's the most secure part in Rampton Hospital. It's one of the most secure wards uh, in, in England, apart from obviously Broadmoor and Ashworth. 
So it's a cell within a cell. And thought, oh, right, how can I do this? So I've got two cell doors. So you've got one metal door that you come in, you go through your archway, you've got another door. When I'm going out and exercise, two members of staff go in your cell with metal detectors and search and everything. The doors, both doors are wide open for when you come back in and I've got to take my shoes off uh, and my clothes and put this suicide strippy uh, stuff on because you're not allowed to wear your clothing and that lot. So I can wear my own clothing to out and exercise and wear my trainers. When you come in, you've got to take them off and change. So what I've done as I've come in, oh, I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I'll give it a go. So as I've come in, I've come round the corner, but I've come round the corner a little bit quick than the members of staff that are behind me. I've got two members of staff. Now they're talking. So as, as I've turned this little corner, I've seen one of the cell doors open. So I've just quickly closed it. I've quickly closed it and it's closed too. And I bent down to take my shoe off. And he's, he didn't even see me close the door because they were taking my trainer off. So with that fast of closing that cell door too, it didn't lock because you've got to lock it. So it's just, it's just open. They, they, it's open and the lock is not locked. They haven't got, you've got to put the key in to pull that big bolt on the, on, on the door. So what's happened is I've just pushed it too. So then obviously I started taking the trainer off and I've gone to the other door and put the trainers outside the other door that's open and took my clothes off, standing, got unchanged, and that's that. So what I'm assuming, what I was hoping and assuming, that the two members of staff would only think only one door is open and the other door is locked. You see it? You see the manipulation, yeah? So I thought it might work and then, well, well I thought it might work and it did work anyway. So yeah, uh, I've got into my cell, got changed and he's obviously, he's coming, lock the door, he's locked it. And obviously, I, I just I thought, right, I, I want to take his attention away of going to the other door and just trying it or locking it. So what I've done is he's, he's locked it in straight away. The other member of staff sat down straight away and started writing. And I started talking to the other member of staff that's locked the door. I thought, if I take his mind off it, it'll, it won't, it'll dis, you know, it won't, it, won't, it, won't, it won't remember to go lock the other door or he'll think the other door's locked because it's closed too. So I started talking to him and said, yeah, yeah, I couldn't believe it. It's good. I'm, I'm just making up conversation that lot, trying to get his attention and that lot. So yeah, he got his attention and that lot and he started, I need to sit down. I went, yeah, 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 sit down, yeah. So he sit down. So it's two members of staff. He's writing on the board what's just happened and that lot. And I'm still talking to him and all this lot. And uh, I'm talking to him and I thought, they haven't looked at the other door. They haven't done it. They haven't done it. Anyway, what's happened is it's starting to come like night staff are coming on. So again, the night staff has come to the door. I'm still at the door talking to the other door. And he says, you're all right. We're doing a handover. And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, everything's fine and that lot. So they're talking just a little bit of the corridor. And uh, what do you call it? I'm, I'm, I'm talking to one of the members of staff. So he's, he's passing over. He went, right, good night. Have a good night. And I said, yeah, yeah, have a good night. The member of staff has turned around and he's come to the door. And he says, so you're all right? I says, yeah, I'm just tired. I'm going to get my head down. He went, you get your head down. I'll check on you in about an hour's time. Something like that. I went, yeah, yeah. I went, you know what I mean? No problems. No, like it's night staff and that lot. You're playing it cool and that lot. So it, again, it's not check that door because the, the other staff would have locked both doors. So it's one of them. And anyway, he's gone up the corridor into the office and doing whatever he's doing. So I've gone round into the other room, the arch room, the other cell, the other cell, and I've gone like that. But push the door open, I thought, is it open? I wonder if it's open or not. Pushed it a little bit, and it just went, oh, no way. It's open. It's open. I thought, right, right, so, right. I thought, right, what am I going to do here? So I had, to, I had to formulate a plan. Right, my plan is I need to escape. I want to get onto the roof. I want to do a rooftop protest. I want to do a roof, you know, rooftop protest and, you know, me innocence and say I'm untreatable, I shouldn't be in here. That you know, there's monsters in here, they're, they're assaulting us and everything. All you know, I wanted to do all that. So, anyway, I've uh, I've started going down towards the corridor. Uh, I, I've gone out, I've gone out of the room, I've dressed myself, got my trainers on, got my clothes on, took the, took the other stuff out, uh, to one side. I've gone down the corridor, checking all the doors, thinking I want one of them to be open so it can go to an outside or an outside yard or to a cupboard or a window or something. Do you know what I mean? And nothing's open, and I thought, never, 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 never. So anyway, I've come back down that corridor. I've tried everything. The windows are really hard as perspex. So I'd have to make a lot of noise to, you know, smash my way through them. And I couldn't because they remember staff would know straight away. So, and I couldn't have nothing to smash. There were nothing. There was everything. They would have bolted to the floor anyway. So like, you know, if I fixed it many times, it just wouldn't. I'd probably break my hand. So anyway, I've come down to the other, other uh, hallway, and the office is at the top, and I thought, right. What am I going to do? I can go into the office, but 
they might have keys in there. I'm thinking they might have keys, spare keys, they might have left them on the side. I'm thinking all that kind of stuff like you do. So I was like looking at the side. So it's like a corner of a wall. And I kept looking, kept looking, and I open and praying that it would like go away, go to the toilet, do something, go to another, go to another room. And it did. After a, after two hours, I think an hour or something like that. So we're like looking, looking, looking. I thought, and he, and he's gone. I can see him like coming out. I looked down. I thought, Shit. and then he's look, he's come, and then I heard him open another door. So then he's gone. I thought, yes. So I've gone down to the office, and I'm looking into this office, and it had like computers. It had the uh, monitor, uh, computer monitors, security. I had my security notes on the table, big photograph of me, and all the security notes and the clipboard and all that. I thought I love that. I was reading what they were there, and they were saying if he gets in misbehaviour, <laughs> rapid tranquilise him. Don't even let him know that he's getting that. Just jump on him. I thought you. You know what I mean? I thought, I thought oh, I could hear all that, and they were writing things down that I didn't even that I wasn't even saying and things like that. Reading all my security notes, and then there were files, and I read my own file. I got my own file and that lot. I thought right, and I got the I got the computer, <laughs> smashed that. I smashed up the floor, but I had to do it very quietly. So I got the chair. There was chair in there, and I put that on the computer screen. Cracked all that, smashed all the computer. I, was, I had to I had to smash it, all, but I had to smash it all very quietly. So I reckon everything, and I had a poo as well. And I wiped all the lyrics all over the wall, uh, peed all over everything, got some poo, put it on the uh, security notes and the files and all that lot. And I had a clipboard, and uh, I had the clipboard in my hand with a security picture. So all that, and I, I thought, I, I couldn't, there were no other doors, I couldn't do anything. So yeah, I was on this corridor, but I, I escaped out of a cell, within a cell. You can't do that, you shouldn't be able to do that, because that could have been potential. This is where night stuff is on one night staff so if i was a serial killer or a serious murder or ian Huntley or charlie bronson me that one person who's held in that cell major security breach similar to that thing that's just happened with that prisoner escaping from one stuff so yeah it's, it's serious one prisoner does that i could have like took him hostage i could have killed that member of the staff and obviously that would have been some serious... If I was such a dangerous psychopath serial killer, I could have done that. No, no, nothing to lose, but I had a lot to lose because I wanted to get out. I just wanted to protest, that's all I wanted to. Because I knew that I hadn't committed a serious offence. I haven't committed murder, I haven't done anything like that. And I knew that I still got a chance, so I didn't want to kill the member of staff. It, it might have crossed my mind, but I didn't, I didn't want to kill him, you know what I mean? So, uh, anyway, uh, so that's happened, and he's, he, I don't know where he's gone. He must have gone onto a different ward or anything like that. And he, he didn't check on me. He didn't check on me until 6 o'clock in the morning, which was all mad. 6 o'clock in the morning, I've heard him, come on, uh, all the staff with the keys and that, they went, what's going on here? And they've they seen, they seen all the office all smashed up and all that with all crap and we poo all over walls. And they started running down the corridor. The pan, the, 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 they pressed the panic button. Uh, all the screws came to the office. And I, I, I had the clipboard with my security file with loads of poo on it. I woke up that morning, so I did go back to sleep. But I thought, right, fair enough. So I opened the door to, and they were all like coming down towards the corridor, towards my cell. And I've obviously, because they thought I were locked up, thinking, well, what's going on here? So much... they, they, they didn't know what to think or what was going on. And I come out with a clipboard, they were, stop where you are, stop where you are. How did you get out? And they were like, all members of staff, another panic button went, loads more staff came. And they turned around and said, stop where you are, face the wall, I went, what? Yeah, have your, have your clipboard. I've seen everything you've been right. You're lucky I didn't get on the roof. You did. You're lucky I didn't protest. You're lucky I didn't take him hostage. I didn't mention that. You're lucky I didn't take him hostage last night. He turned around and said, stand at the wall. I stand at the wall. He came rushing. They smashed me head against the wall. My nose bust. And obviously, put me back on the wall. Then put me in the uh, room. Locked me in the room. Loads of staff were surrounding both of the rooms. Checked all the rooms. They came in the room again, checked all the rooms to see if there was big holes that had been digging out. They can't understand how my door was left open or unlocked. Then obviously the clinical director of Rampton Hospital himself, who runs the whole Rampton Hospital site himself, he was the clinical director of the place. He came down and said, uh, well, the staff turned around and said, uh, you, you, you've committed uh, some serious major security breach here. We want to know why you got out and all this stuff. I said, I'm not saying I'm not saying nothing. I'm not saying anything. Well, did someone unlock you? Did so, have you got a key? What, what was going on? So I was just keeping them, like, playing at bay and that lot. Said, well, we've got someone come to see you. Went, oh, he's the boss. He's the big boss. I went, he's the big boss. Good, I want to see the big boss. I want to see the big boss. Good, good. I'll tell the big boss. You want to, you're going to tell the big boss. I went, I'll tell the big boss. So the big boss came, his beard and all that, and he turned around and he went, and I've seen his batch in clinical director. And he went, yes, I'm the clinical director of Rampton Hospital. I'm in charge of this site. And he went, how did you, I went, how that? I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I've got some exciting news to announce. 
Michael Francis is coming back to tour the UK in 2024. The remade mentor, the Michael Francis story. Michael Francis, once named one of the 50 most significant mob bosses in the USA by Fortune magazine, and a former member of the notorious Colombo crime family, will take you deep into the world of organized crime, sharing captivating tales and insights into the Mafia's past, present, and future. Join us for an unforgettable evening with Michael Francis, the original Goodfella, as he exclusively sits down with myself, Sean Atwood. With me as the host, there's going to be a no-holes-barred exploration of Michael Francis's life, including his numerous arrests and jury trials that ultimately led to his pleading guilty to a federal racketeering charge, a 10-year prison sentence, and $15 million in restitution. You will have the unique opportunity to ask questions during an audience Q&A session, making this event a must-see for true crime enthusiasts and anyone curious about the underworld. Don't miss this explosive In Conversation with Michael Francis. Live on stage in the UK, this exclusive in-person event will be held in various locations in the UK, Ireland and Scotland. Link in the description box below this video if you want to grab yourself a ticket. Back to the podcast. Cheers. How did you get out of your cell? I went, this is one of the most secure, secure parts of Rampton Hospital. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, he was just, they were so angry. They were so angry at me, but I, I, I was just like so amazed. I don't know. But he was just so angry. And I, I just explained. And I told him what I did. I told him about the manipulation. He went, so you haven't got a key? No members of staff let you out? I went, no, they didn't. I went, I just manipulated you. I just manipulated, I just closed the door too, like that. So it's so daft, isn't it? How, how thick do they think they are now, you know what I mean? They're <laughs> members of staff. So obviously that's that. And after that, I was uh, escorted with five members of staff. After that, I was classed as a serious high security breach. And everywhere I would go, members of staff. So what they've done then is uh, they've, all, they've got a new CCTV on the wall. So they've come into my cell. And obviously, whilst I'm on exercise with the members of staff, They've implanted a CCTV camera inside inside the cell where I was, outside on the wall and in the office because of what I've done, that major security breach. So then uh, they turned around and said, uh, there's someone come to see you. He's in charge of the data side. He went, you could possibly be going to the data. I went, no, I don't fit criteria for that. Uh, so anyway, I sat in this room with him and he's, uh, he's saying about the security breach. And because of the security breach, he turned around and said, Due to the security breach going over to the dark side, we can't facilitate your high security at this at this place. I went, well, what's the dark side? And that's when he turned around and said, it's a DSPD. I went, what's the DSPD? Even it's the dangerous severe personality disorder unit. It's for people like you, untreatable, that we'll lock up for years. I went, for years? I went, you're going to scare me? I went, I'll just go over there and do the same. I refuse. I'll, I'll, I'll threaten your staff. I'll kill them. I'll do this. We'll see. We've got some very highly trained staff over there, different from the staff over here. Uh, I went, I'm going to make you turn around and said that I don't fit the criteria. But now all of a sudden, I fit criteria to go over there. Now I fit criteria to be a psychopath. And his words was, I can make anyone fit the criteria. I went, you what? I went, you're nasty, you are. I went, you're abusing your power of trust. I went, I'll, I'll get you done. I'll do this and all that. Lot. And I did. I did. I, I wrote my letters to MPs, House of Parliament, the Queen, anyone who would listen. <laughs> you know what I mean? No one would listen. I get no replies back. I, I get probably one ply from some sort of Secretary of State who's the Secretary saying your, 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 your letter's been acknowledged. That is it. So I'm writing to all these people about escaping, about doing this, about wanting to kill staff, about that. They weren't going to listen to me. I'm just a nut in some maximum security hospital, am I? But I did try. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's no harm in trying, is there? There's no harm in trying. Yeah, writing to all these, uh, you know, Prime Minister, I wrote to Prime Minister telling him, wrote to Home Secretary, Justice Secretary, nothing. I won't get nothing. So. It was just a window no situation, was it? Oh, never. So anyway, they put me over to the dark side, trying to scare me, intimidate me, and they said, yeah, you, you'll like it over here. Uh, I went, why will I like it? There's, there's loads of treatment, occupational therapists, there's a gym, I tried to sell it me again. I went, what are you trying to do? I went, you did it last time to, last time to me, trying to sell it me. Uh, and obviously, this, this unit is built, it's like a fence. So you've got your high security, what, your, your fence is round it, which makes it high security in itself because there's only three maximum security hospitals in Britain, Ashworth, Broadmoor and Rampton. That is it. 
That's all you've got in England. Then you've got, obviously, your car stairs in Scotland and Dundrum in Ireland. But in England, you've just got three maximum, which is Broadmoor, Ashworth, from Rampton. So uh, in Rampton Hospital, they've built this new unit, so it's extra, extra, extra secure. So this unit is called the DSPD, which we mentioned before. This, this is an extreme unit. This is... This is a 70 bed unit. You can Google it yourself. What is the DSPD? And it, they, they name it something else. It's called the Peaks unit. Like they've got like different names of like trees and areas. So Brecon Ward, you know, the Breckens, the Peaks. So they named it the Peaks, but it is classed the DSPD. If you Google it yourself, DSPD projects, Ramson Hospital, it shows you and what it was and how it was set up and what it was designed to do. So it's a new unit where the government founded millions of pounds into this unit to assess three dangerous untreatable psychopaths such as me charlie bronson robert Mosley, uh what's his name michael stone who killed uh lyndon megan russell who supposedly killed him or he's claiming his instance i don't know uh so yeah untreatable psychopaths like me and it's a unit that would detain untreatable psychopaths for a period of what 30 40 50 years of not your own natural life that's what i was told so i'm now on the big boys ward i'm never getting out and I'm not even serving a life sentence, a whole life sentence, or anything like that. I'm serving a six-year sentence, and time is clicking on. I'm doing more time. I've done my six years now. My six years is passing. It's overlapping. So I'm, 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 I'm just detained. I'm on a section uh, 37, detained on the Mental Health Act 1983, uh, with a restriction order imposed by the Home Office not to let me out because I'm refusing to engage in assessments and treatment. So I'm over this unit and again, they were trying to get me to engage in treatment. They come over to me and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. Uh, and I turn around and say, F off, I'm untreatable psychopath and all that lot. So I thought, I'm not going to get anywhere with this. And I thought, right, I'm going to go on a protest. I thought about protest. I don't know, I thought about other protests, people going on protest to claim their innocence and not eating and things like that. So I went on a hunger strike. Uh, and I talked to the solicitor and he said that it's classed, it could be classed as a part of self-harm because that's what the psychiatrist said. Uh, but he only lasted 12 hours on that. I was hungry anyway. So I came off that, I came off that straight away because uh, I said, well, I'm not eating, I'm not eating. And obviously they turned around and said, you could be classed as self-harm yourself and you weren't able to fight your cause of untreatability because you'd be classed as having an unsound mind. Even though I could be classed as an unsound mind, mind anyway because I'm detained in Rampton. You know what I mean? It, it was just mad. So then I thought, oh, what am I going to do? I thought, right, I will walk. I will walk. I'll just sit down and refuse to walk. Uh, the, the members of staff, I made them work for the pennies. They was horrible to me. They'd abuse me. They threatened me. They'd intimidate me and say, you're being until you're 90 years old. They'd uh, come out of my bed, try to rip me out of my uh, room and, you know, pull me. Uh, all that kind of rubbish. So what I would what do then is... Uh, I say, right, I refuse to walk. I sit down, cross my legs, uh, cross my legs, cross my arms, sit down and went, refusing to walk. He said, yeah. They got permission to pick me up and bodily carry me from one area to another. I refused to sit in the day area. They bodily picked me up and there'd be like three chairs at the back of the day area. So there's uh, like member of staff there, another member of staff there. So there'd be two members of staff and they forced me, bodily forced me and stick me in the chair, holding me arms like that while all the other patients are there. And I'm like the crazy one with two members of staff. Sitting there, they're bodily forcing me to sit down. I said, I don't want to sit down. I went, why, why are you doing this? And we said, we call this reintegrating into society. That's what they called it. That, that's, their, that's their society. That's what they wanted me to do. They wanted me to reintegrate into their society, which is with all the other nutters that are on the ward and, you know, these guys shagging goats and things like that and all mad weird stuff and people and some and all that lot. You, know, you want me to sit with them? You know, I'd rather sit here. You can restrain me, but that's what they called it. We, we call this reintegrating society. You will sit in this area. They force me to sit in these chairs and stick these and want, and they, eventually they think that I will go join and reintegrate with all these normal people. And it, every normal man. Crazy lunatics. So anyway, yeah. Uh, anyway, so the body force me. I said, I don't want to sit here. And they went, well, you are sitting here. I went, no, I won't sit here. I want to go back to my room. I want to go back to my room, uh, bedroom or seclusion. Did you know? I went, you ready? And they went, what? And I went, I tried to bite them like that. They grab me, restrain me, put me on the floor, and they put me in seclusion. So I was in seclusion. They were called, they had these uh, tilt restrictions called Richard Tilt. Richard Tilt was this uh, guy who brought in these restrictions which means that you can get so much time out of your cell in there. Like you can, if you behave yourself,
stuff. They'd like, we'd watch it. And say, if you behave yourself, you can stay up till half nine in the dairy and watch films and, you know, like you're a child again. Oh, you, if, you, if you behave yourself, we give you a bar of chocolate, you know, dickheads like that. You know what I mean? That's how they try to work us in there, do you know what I mean? Or you can go to Blue Jays, watch Blue Jays, it's a disco, so you can mix with other people and female patients as well. You can have a girlfriend, you can do this. I did obviously mix one time uh, and I went to this and they give you non alcoholic beer. Calibra, have you ever heard of Calibra? And people that are in there, all the mad crazy people, oh yes, I like this getting drunk. It's like not 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 put not not point one percent alcohol. That shouldn't even be allowed. That should be that should be in the press right now. They, they, they were selling, I know it was not point not percent alcohol, but they shouldn't even be doing that in the places like that. It was like it was like luxury, but it wasn't luxury. You know, wrapped on maximum security hospital with your swimming pools, your, your, your money, and if you do more courses. You know, if, you, if you go in there, people are earning more people. Well, you're earning more of a living in there as a patient than you are in the community. Hey, I tell everyone, come to Rampton. You get money in there. You know what I mean? Come on, I'll, I'll advertise it. You go to Rampton, you might lose your little life and your freedom and do 50 years in there, but you get money. You get benefits. You get a swimming pool. You go in there. People are probably say, yeah, I'll go in there just to get away from my wife. No, I don't know. I'm only, I should be comical because it's serious. But yeah, uh, on a level, on a level, serious. That's what they were trying to do. We were trying to sell it, me, and I wasn't having any of it. Uh, I, 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 I won't engage in anything like that. So they started to close down on me. So they'd be like, they tried to get other patients to retaliate against me. So there'd be patients in there smoking before the non-smoking policy proper came out. So there'd be patients going in the smoking room and smoking. And because I was the only one on a seventy-bed ward unit who was refusing to engage, they turned around and said. You, won't, you can't smoke until everyone, because he's probably finished his therapy earlier. And he can't smoke until he goes and does his therapy. And they were, they were trying to blackmail and intimidate me by getting other patients to fight me. You know, to get, and, and, but do you know what it was? All the patients knew exactly what I was doing. And it was on my side and says, I'm not going to let these dickheads wind me up on that lot because I know that they want us to fight. You know, you're doing your little course. You know exactly what you're doing and that lot. You know what I mean? You're, you're untreatable. And, you know, you're, you, you, you're not what you're doing. You might be in there for a long haul, but, you know, you're untreatable. You're out, you, you don't engage in treatment. So on a ward, on a day-to-day -day basis, they restrain me, get me out, uh, carry me around, carry me to the shower, get me on showers. One, well, they tried to shower me one time. I went, F off your dirty, do you know what I mean? They tried to shower me, and I said, you know, that's like dirty sexual assaults and things like that, and I didn't want that. So I washed myself, dried myself, dip back on the floor, and they carried me for about three months. But they, three months. Yeah, and I've carried me for three months. Every day, it's hard work, isn't it? I thought I'd make these work for the pennies, and I did, yeah? But three months, they did get wise to it. Do you know what they did after three months? They wheel a wheelchair in, didn't they? Sat me in a wheelchair. Sort of wheelchair me for free, another three months everywhere. Yeah, I thought I'd make them work for the pennies. Uh, so, yeah, that one. And uh, so what happened then is, I'm trying to think, how did I get onto the ICU? Oh, oh yeah, that's it. So I got, on, I got onto the ICU department on the DSPD because they've got their own as well. They, they thought about it when, they've, when they designed this DSPD system. They've took the initiative of building a unit for the most dangerous disturbed prisoners patients, which is another ICU. So they built an ICU also on the DSPD system. So yeah, uh, they, they, had, they, had very, they had a, a replica near enough, an ICU for that. So I was threatening the staff on a daily basis, uh, threatening to kill them, threatening to harm them, uh, and also threatening to stab them with a pen. So that's when they turned around and said, right, we're gonna put you down on the ICU. So I remained on the ICU department again, but you know what I did? They didn't, they just, I think what they did is totally forget what I did in the main part of the hospital. And I did exactly the same. I was within a cell, within a cell. I manipulated it. There were two doors and it did exactly the same again. You shouldn't talk to Dr. Bobby, tell you exactly that. I've two, two escapes. The second one was where there was a night female officer on, but she was on, her name called Sarah. And then there was other members of staff. So there was like one member of staff to each ward. And she was like watching two wards, like watching me on the ICU and watching her own ward because of the lack of staff on that lot. So what's happened is, uh, again, I've done exactly the same thing, coming off exercise, push the door to, they didn't look at it. And obviously what I've done on this one, this one had to, this one was a little bit different is I've come into the door and I've held on to the door. So it's got like a wooden latch that the window goes up like that. And I've held on to the wooden latch to open the door so it looks like, because it, it, it wouldn't close, you know, you had to hold it onto it so it stays closed, but not locked. So I'm holding onto this latch like that, and I'm talking through the door, 
talking to the members of staff, the night staff came on and all that lot, still talking to them. They didn't like lean across it or anything like that. They didn't talk to me, they didn't. They just sat down and everything. So I manipulated it again like that and then the night staff went off and then what happened is this office, uh, I thought, right, I'm going to escape. So I got dressed and I was walking on the corridor. There's only one way out so it's up the corridor. So this one was a bit different. So I've crawled on my hands and knees because they've got an office door and the office door where the night staff are is there. So I'm on my hands and knees and I'm crawling on the floor and I thought, yeah, I'm walking past all can you know members of staff in the office and they're just there and, you know, like the door's open there and they're talking there and I'm crawling on my hands and knees. So I'm crawling on my hands and knees and as I'm, 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 I'm passing through my legs, it was my legs that gave it away, absolutely gutted. So obviously the members of staff, what, he's out, someone's out, someone's out, he's out, oh, that, that's what I heard, he's out, he's out, panic button's been pressed, and I've had to sit down and went, stay there, stay there, loads of staff from all the other wards have come over, from the main part of the hospital, they've come over, and again, I've done all that, and they've obviously turned around and said, how'd you get out, what, this, that, another, and I turned around, and I told them all again, and went, I've done exactly the same thing, what you've done again, so again, what they've done, they've installed another camera in there, because they want a camera, I turned around and I went, you did exactly the same. And he went, well, what were your intentions? I went, I turned around this time. I went, my intentions was to kidnap uh, a, a, a night officer and tell them to release me. That's what my intentions was. So after that, I was escorted everywhere with five members of staff. And they had to get extra staff, nursing care staff on agency uh, for who worked for the NHS to come in from the outside to look after me. Uh, yeah, so I had five members of staff. They'd have to restrain me and carry me everywhere. They carry me everywhere and then they walk me everywhere as well. So there'd be two members of staff holding me in constant restraints, walking me around. Uh, so I had to go up to healthcare one time uh, in the main part of the hospital. And uh, they turned around and said, You can't go there. I went, Why? Uh, and I seen a female member, uh, a fe I seen a female patient. And I went, Who's that? They went, You don't know who that is, do you? I went, No, who is it? He went, That's Beverly Allen. I went, Beverly Allen, Angel of Death. He went, Yeah, you can't go any further. And I looked at that lot. I went, Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I went, shut up, can you stop? Can you stop being your mate? You know, you know, I went, can you hear me? And she looks, Beverly Allen. I seen Beverly Allen. First time I see because she's in there. We, we share the same health care. The female patients and the male patients, we all share the same health care. And it was the first time that I seen Beverly Allen, the angel of death, who killed 13 children. That's the one I'm, not, I'm not boasting about that. It was just obviously, I couldn't believe I was shot. Uh, she was she, she, very butch, uh, and she's got long hair now. Not the short hair that people see on them stupid photos. You're saying that Lucy Letby was inspired by her and you Absolutely. The same yeah, I, I, yeah, I heard, I heard all about that. I'm, I tell a few family members, obviously. I said, yeah, it was the one time when I seen Beverly Allen, who was on the healthcare. I think I was going up for a dental appointment, and she was going up for something else. And I think it was only about here to there, to that end of the wall. Can you see? So from here, about how, 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 how far would you say that is? That wall, the glass. Uh, not not this glass, the, the wall there. Oh, the far wall. Yeah. yeah, about 50 feet, is it? About 50 feet. So, yeah, that, that's what I mean. It's like loads of staff surrounding her. Staff surrounding me, but I'm held. I'm in restraints, don't forget, because I'm being breaching all that security. And they turned around and said, you can't go any further. I went, why? I went, that's Beverly Allen. I went, that's Beverly Allen. And that's where I shouted, because I wanted to make a scene. And I, hello, hello. And they were like restraining me more. And I went, what's the point? Get off, get off. So I'm making a scene and that lot. And she was looking and I seen Beverly Allen. I went, hello, yeah, I know, I, I know you. <laughs> And that was it. That's all I said. I didn't say anything else. That, that was all I could think of. That's all I said. So, yeah, that was mad. Uh, well, uh, so, yeah, anyway, they kept me in there. And anyway, I thought, you know, two, two years has passed now in Rampton Hospital. And I thought, I'm never getting out of this place. Uh, so I thought of seriously doing something very serious. I thought about taking one of the managers hostage with a pen. Now, I've got to be careful, I say this, but I did tell them in there, so don't want to get re-arrested or anything like that, but it was, and I told them what I was planning to do anyway. So, because they knew anyway, I was planning to take members of staff hostage and that lot, I've got conviction for that now. Uh, and basically, what I would do is I would complain to a manager about how the hospital staff would be treating me, assaulting me whilst they're restraining me, and I'd get a, one of them pens there, you know what the uh, ballpark plants a big yeah. pen and i'd have it in my waistband so I'd, what i'd do is i'd go in there and i'd uh i'd have him in mind that i'll go around him and get the pen and stick it towards his neck and take him hostage because that was that's where it was coming to the extreme now where these thoughts were coming to the forefront and i thought i need to i need to do something i need to get out or i need to show them that i'm serious uh, and on two occasions, I flapped it. I'll be honest with you, I flapped it. And I thought, no, no, no. So we're talking to my solicitor, and I told him, I said, I need to get out. I want to go back to prison, but I've got, I've got this time 
where it's just unlimited. I'm, I'm going to be here for life. I'm basically lifed off. Now, I thought, if I get, an, if I get another prison sentence, do you think I could try to go back to uh, jail? And he went, yeah, what about try, uh, can you confess to all crimes, Miss Lissa? Miss Lissa was in on it. They were spot on there. They were not bent. They were just knew the law. They knew the loopholes that I could try, get under and, and do. They went, try to confess to all crimes that, you've, uh, that you haven't done and things like that. Uh, and I turned around and I said, well, are we going to take him hostage with a pen, uh, a pen and that lot? He went, no, 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 I'll do that. I went, why? He went, there's a new, there's a new sentence that's just come in. This was in 2005, IPP, mm-hmm. Indeterminate Public Protection for, yeah, uh, in, indefinite, what is it, indefinite, in, what is it, what does uh, IPP stand for? Indefinite Public Protection. And it would basically, it, for, it would give prisoners a life sentence with a tariff with 99 years license, wouldn't it? So it'd be new, it was a new law that just come in, IPP, indeterminate public protection uh, for lifers that will come in and two striking you out. If you commit a serious offence or a specified offence, then you will get a life sentence with a type of people would do more than the tariff because it, it, was, just, it was just wrong. That was where David Blunkett bringing in the IPP law, wasn't it? They never were, they got scrapped into what it's called. So yeah, uh, he turned around and said, no, no, don't, don't, don't do that, you get a life sentence. I went, what, what, what are we going to do then? He went, what you need to do is try to try 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 to com- uh, confess the crimes that you haven't committed and maybe get a, a charge like I went. What do you think it work? I went. Yeah. So he said, he said yeah. So I tried to. Uh, I talked to the psychiatrist who were looking after me, and I says, you've, you've had me now two years, you know, down while I'm untreatable, and I shouldn't be in a... He went, well, that's up to a tribunal to decide. I went, you, I went I've, ref- I've consistently refused all your assessments and all your treatments. I'm looking at me, I'm still here. I went, I've breached security twice. I've tried to get out of your cell twice, cell within a cell. I went, I've breached serious security. He went, yeah. He went, I give you, I give you your tune. Yeah, you've, you've done what you've said. You haven't engaged... You're causing some major security incidents, yeah? This is the clinical director of the Personal Disorder Directorate Services. And also, he was the one who helped set up the DSPD systems in hospital, in Broadmoor, and in the prison setting. So this, this, this man is very small and little glassy. Look, it looks like a little penfold out of Danger Mouse. But I swear to God, it's like Napoleon. He's a powerful man, but dangerous. Like I told you, he turned around and said, I can make you fit the criteria. He made me fit a psychopath. He's the one who diagnosed me. He, he's the one who done a psychopathy checklist, psychopathy, and diagnosed me as a clinical psychopath, untreatable, and that is the label that still hangs around my neck to this day. He's a horrible, nasty, dangerous psychopath, psychopath, psychiatrist, psychopath, and psychiatrist. <laughs> he should be in there. So uh, yeah, basically, I confessed the crime. So I've uh, contacted West Yorkshire Police, and uh, basically, I've confessed to burglaries. And uh, I think I've got some paperwork here. I think let me just go through that if you don't mind. Yeah, check it out. Paperwork here. I've got some. Uh... So yeah, this is uh, a letter from West Yorkshire Police. I think they might be able to see the 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 uh, West Yorkshire Police there. If I probably hold it up and probably might be able to zoom in on that. But on the air, because I've obviously showed yourself here, uh, I've confessed to crimes which is dwelling burglaries, which the police come in from West Yorkshire, and they like have old logs of the dwelling burglaries of the addresses and they say that you must have you know you must have committed that crime so we'll fit you to that so i said yeah i did do that and uh my solicitor put obviously he needs to confess to more serious crimes which we've got here section 18 wounding intent possession of a firearm gun is apparently buried his fingerprints will be on it weapon and a robbery and this is as you can see it's the solicitor's letter is that it's got the solicitor's uh, log in there it's got the cid with west Yorkshire police there and obviously i'm still it says down here, I've wrote, I wrote on the bottom of here, it's my writing. Still waiting to be interviewed by Huddersfield Police, waiting for that. And obviously they came back, uh, the date on that, uh, as you can see, that was 17th of the 11th or 6th. And the date on the police letter is the 20th of October 26. And all that came back is, sorry, it's not in the best interest of the public to prosecute you because you're already detained on the mental health by 993. I thought, never, what am I supposed to do? There's serious offences, burglaries, section 18, uh, stabbing basically a, a firearm gun that's buried with my finger it's interesting when I know I don't think they believe me so it's one of them uh, so I thought right all right then and that's, that, that was that and I thought it got me set me, it set me thinking though I thought because the psychiatrist turned around to me and he said he said so you wanted to go back to prison I went yeah but I've got no prison time left he went that's right I said well if I get a sentence will you, will you discharge me back to prison because you can't do nothing with me he won't ever treat me. He went, well, that's debatable. I went, no matter how many years, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you might. He went, yeah, I'll give you duty for two years. You've consistently refused. I went, yeah, I'm the only person on a 70-bed unit 
that's refusing to totally engage in anything. No gym, because do you know if you go, if you like do gym and things like that, it's classed as occupational therapy, classed as treatment. To, 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 to do things, it was so defined treatment, if treatment's available, if it's making you worse, if it's doing this. And I had to show, I had to show to an extent, I had to eat my own piss and drink, I, no, I had to eat my own piss and drink my own piss in front of the nursing staff on the daycare area, because what they were trying to say is, Nursing care, do you, do you, uh, what is it? Nursing care, nursing care rehabilitation, rehabilitation was benefiting me, even being me being just on a ward and being looked after by nursing staff. It was classed as treatment and it was classed as appropriate treatment. So, what I had to show is go to the extreme lengths, like you said before when you started this. I had to go to the extreme lengths, I had to poo, I had to eat it, I had to mess around with my own weed, drink it and eat it and do all that kind of stuff. Just to show that my mental health was deteriorating by keeping on a ward. And they were saying, why are you doing that? I said, well, I don't know. I said, I just can't cope anymore. Can't, but I knew exactly what we were doing. I had to show them that my mental health was deteriorating. It must have deteriorated for me to do that. It must have, I don't know. Or unless that's normal. I don't know. It's up to people to judge if that's normal or not. Uh, so, yeah, there was that. And they'd like put low stimulus on a ward, they turn off the radio, turn off the TV, won't give me no papers, nothing to read, so I'd have to sit there. And the members of staff refused to talk to me as well, unless I was going to talk to them about engaging treatment. So I like talking to you and say, yeah, how's today? It's good and that lot. Yeah, my family's going to come up tomorrow, this, that, and other. And they just, non plus, they won't talk to me. And they, they won't talk to me. They talk to me at the beginning and say, we will not talk to you unless you talk to us about engaging therapy. Blackmailing me, it's coercing me, isn't it? That man coercing me into a treatment. Anyway, so I thought of, like we were getting back to you, I thought of, right, I need to commit an offence on purpose. Try to get out of here. So I spoke to my psychiatrist, and like I was telling you, he said, if, if, if you get a sentence for these uh, offences, that's what he originally said, for these uh, West Yorkshire offences, the burglary and that law, if you get a sentence of 12 months or more, yes, I'll discharge you back to the prison services without a medical recommendation, which means that you won't come back to us. I went, you promised. So the, this psychiatrist, he's failed me already because he's helping me. He can't, he, I'm in a maximum security hospital. They, you're not supposed to do that. He, imagine if I was a murderer, a serial killer. Well, I'm supposed to be a murderer and a serial killer and a cannibal and all this mad crap that they're saying about me. You know what I mean? Imagine if they released me on the street and I go around killing and eating people. You know what I mean? Who's the, who's the blood on? Who's the, who's the blood's hands going to be on? It's going to be on their hands, isn't it? You know, to this day, 10 years later, I haven't killed anyone, I'm not eating anyone. I might think it, but, you know, that's between me and you. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Uh, but it's one of them, it? you know what I mean? What are they going to do? They're going to lock me up for thinking it. They're not, are they? <laughs> Can't lock me up for thinking it, can you? No. Uh, it's gone. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the past. It's just, it's just, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't look at him and think he's nice. Yeah, he ain't got much meat on him, so I won't eat him. You know what I mean? I like a chubby person. No, what about him? So uh, I thought about... Uh, he turned around and said, if you get a sentence of 12 months or more, yes, I'll discharge you back to the prison services. So, obviously, I went to this guy who was in there. He's now called Terry Gill. He's been in there 40 years. I thought, this guy will know what offence I can commit to try to get back out, because he probably has been in the system a long time, which he has. So I went up to this patient. I went, listen to me. I went, listen, just between me and you, I went, I need to commit an offence in here to try to get back to prison. He went, what was He went, the only, one, the only thing I can think of that will get you back to prison. You ready? You ready? Kill a member of staff. I went, what? <laughs> I know I shouldn't say it, but that's what you said. He went, kill a member of staff. I went, kill a member of staff. I thought, this guy's a lunatic. No wonder he's been in 40 years. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not going to go kill a member of staff. I'm going to get life. So I went, all right, then, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll consider that. He went, yeah, yeah. So I walked away. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so I thought, no, no. So I've gone back to Mr. Lewis and I said, what am I going to do? I went, should I stab someone or someone or like that? He went, you'll get an IPP, you'll get a life sentence. You need to commit, I went, what? A non-violent crime. Went, That's right, a non-violent crime. I went, right, okay. And it, it just got me, set me thinking. So uh, <laughs> we've, we've got something here to show you. As you can see, this is, uh, as you can see, it's a very old copy of a letter, isn't it? The threats to kill letter. 3rd of January, 2007, yes? So this is a statement. This is, I thought, right, it's a book on the side and it had all, like, names of all the care people that are, are in that place, in Rampton DSPD, all the staff's name in there. It was a booklet that was left on the side with all the names. So I got bored and I thought, right, fair enough, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do a threat to kill letter. That's a non-violent thing. I didn't think of the seriousness of 
threats to kill can be classed as serious. I didn't think that, I just didn't know. I would like to say the longer you stay near a Rampton DSPD unit, I personally believe I may murder, kill a Rampton authority person within Rampton Hospital DSPD unit. Crazy, isn't it, this? So uh, basically, I have, I have so much bitter anger towards all persons within Rampton DSPD unit. Here are some names I may kill or murder within Rampton Hospital. And as you can see, I won't name the names. 50 it's names. Personal. There's 50 names. Names. Keep going. Yep. Keep going. Three, three pages of them. Yeah. So I put, it's, and then I put, it's only a matter of time until I take one of these persons hostage or I will kill, murder one of them within Rampton Hospital DSPD unit. I know it's going a bit far-fetched, but you know, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to be far-fetched. And if they say I'm a psychopath, then I might as well act like a psychopath, innit? Uh, so basically, I said, I feel I have got worse and that this hospital environment is not benefiting me. I mentioned that over 50 names who work within Rampton Hospital, the SPD unit, and I will and can get to one of these names I have mentioned already. I will and can get to any staff member. Uh, if, you, if you lock me up in a room or seclusion for a very long time, that's the only time that basically I can't kill anyone. Uh, and I put, I will always reoffend whilst locked up in Rampton DSPD unit. This is my path, and I chose this path and this journey. I thought, well, why not? The hell with it. I'm, I'm wiped off anyway. What, what more can they do? Give me another life sentence on top of a life sentence that I'm doing. I'm classed as a life sentence, but by being detained in Rampton, and you know, you're never getting out. And I put, this is my life. If I have to take a member of staff's life, all because this place have drove me to murder, kill someone within this environment, then so be it. Rest in peace. The sorry who will be killed within Rampton Hospital DSPD unit. Sorry for swearing. Uh, remember, you can stop me if you just know how to. Yours, the untreatable psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so this is a letter that's already, that I've already been convicted for. So that's why I can say it, because I've been charged and I've been convicted for it. That's correct, yes? But they can't redo me for that. So that's what you wanted was the charge. That's the one, yes. Yeah? So originally, the charge... Uh, well, that was that 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 one that one that I've just read out. That was a concurrent to this one. This one is uh, between four six or six twenty six uh, twenty two or six or six. This is a summons from uh, Rampton Hospital charge, basically, or the charge sheet from the summons uh, caused the psychiatrist in, in charge to fear that violence will be used against him by your course of conduct, which you know ought to, ought to know, basically on threatening letters under the harassment act, and this is what is. Police statement says this is his police statement. As you can see, uh, original police kind of rubbish that they're doing over there. So, yeah, it basically says this responsible medical officer under section 12 of mental health at 9 is responsible for me. Uh, he's fit to be interviewed at the present time. Situation changes, he will inform the police. He's in a position to express an expert opinion, really. Expert opinion. He can make it. Remember, he can make it. He can make any criteria, can't he? He can basically say that you're a psychopath and label you for that and damage your life forever. And he's a dangerous man, this guy. I, I'm a physician to express an expert opinion in the case of, I'm able to say he would know the nature and quality of the act alleged and is a fair and aware of the difference between right and wrong. He would understand court proceedings. In my opinion, the patient did not for any reason, uh, what's that, or did not for a reason of mental disorder know the nature or quality of the alleged effect, uh, offence. Or serious of allegation is beneficial to pursue legal action in aid future risk uh, management. Uh, and it says, I would like to make the following observation comments relating to the impact that the conviction in respect of the allegation will make in the treatment of this patient. That greatly made threats to members of the staff, both orally and in writing, as we both discussed. He's fully aware of the consequences of his actions and his intent by making such threats is to obtain a prison sentence so that he can be discharged from detention in hospital. Says it himself, doesn't it? You know what I mean? He's failing me by saying it himself. This is a consultant forensic psychiatrist who's well known in England. He's one of, supposed to be one of the most respectable psychiatrists in the UK. Uh, he's actively disengaged from treatment process. This is considered decision and what, one which he has made of his own free will. The imposition of a prison sentence would not have any deterioration effect on his mental condition. He would not suffer any significant deterioration if such sentence were imposed. Uh, and it basically goes further to exhibits uh, remains of one of the patients on the peach unit the peach unit which is described as you is and it's called the peach unit which is called the dspd unit which is the dangerous severe personality disorder unit in ramson it's at ramson hospital it's detained under section 415 of the mental health at 983 which is national hospital order his prison sentence is expired is any period of supervision is legally classified as uh, it's having a personality disorder, significant issue of violence, and being admitted to the pitch unit, you're constantly trying to subvert security, which is the attempt escapes. 
and shows no respect to authority, is constantly claimed he was untreatable and therefore should not be in the hospital. However, as most review tribunals said that he should remain with us, which basically says you, you, you need to remain there forever. Uh, as written, uh, many, many uh, letters to those professionals involved, which you see in the threats to kill letters, yeah, they contend that threats, untreatable and certain threats to harm the addressees, and there'll be a bundle of uh, 20 such letters covering a letter to his, uh, his solicitor, uh, and he wanted me to read them out, but I refused, he indicated that these letters should be sent to the police, then he was untreatable and I will kill you eight times, and I refer to these as police items. I received a third for three letters based on these police items addressed to myself, one being, uh, being to de uh, DC Rachel Cook and the head of the CPS. The letters contained the threat that patient would have one of his friends follow me out of Ramson to my home address, kidnap me as, I, as a direct uh, result of this. I t uh, and the fact that he caused me a amount of uh, concern, I, sp I specifically took a different route home, making sure that I wasn't being followed. Also, having to deal with him all through, I'm never alone. I've requested extra vigilant and uh, aware that, uh, of the risk of violence towards me. So, yeah, I, basically, what I'm saying, that's what I originally charged with. And uh, there was two other offences that run concurrent, which was the threats to kill 50 members of staff, which I've just said then. Uh, do you know something which is really funny about it? I know I'm, I'm not just coming to this as well. Charlie Ronson, he tried to go for release, and I know he's threatened to kill and obviously, you know, well, I, I don't know if he's threatened to kill, but I know he's obviously done what he's done in prison, he's fighting against authorities. But what I'm trying to say, obviously, in Charlie Bronson's defence is, I'm an untreatable psychopath on the street now, which I shouldn't be by law because I got up through a legal loophole, which I'm just going to close that point right in a minute, yeah? Uh, but I threatened to kill 50 members of staff and I've been convicted for it and I'm on the street. So why is Charlie Bronson not out? And he ain't he threatened to kill anyone. I'm sure he's not probably threatened to kill 50 members of staff. And I'm, I'm out there. And, you know, he should be out. You know, he's done less than Definitely. that. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, so I'm just trying to support him in that, in that, in that, in that yeah, respect. Yeah, we all support him. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I was charged with threats to kill my doctor and two offences run concurrent. The two offences was the threat to kill 50 members of staff and also because the police are, were getting a bit impatient waiting for the summons and charge to come through. So as you can see, I also sent a letter to DC, uh, the uh, CID police officer there, and I said, you're not taking my threats in this serious. So what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to get my friends to also uh, firebomb Redford Police Station on my behalf because you're not taking me ser you're not taking my threats serious. I can say this because I've been convicted for these offences. So it's all right. I'm not going to get reconvicted because I've already been convicted for him. So yeah, I I, I was convicted for threats to kill my psychiatrist and the other two offences run concurrent. In in itself, you should be I should be serving a life sentence for that, really, shall I? Do you think? Threats to kill fifteen members of staff. Threat to fire bomb Redford Police Station. Threat to kill my RMO, responsible medical officer. A lot of people would be. Yeah, yeah. should be. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's why. Uh, uh, so basically, what's happened then is I eventually got the summons through, which I got the charge, and I was so relieved. And members of staff kept saying to me, "You know, Summer, if you get out of this system, you would have beat the system." It means you, no one's getting out. You came in. It, you, do you know what one of them said? You came in mad as a hat, and you're going out mad as a hat. <laughs> that that never happens. It just it just don't happen. You know, we don't know if you're going to go out and kill and eat people and stab people because that's what you've been threatening to do forever, aren't you? That's why you beat. That's why you're with us. You know, but you you've refused to engage in assessment, people. So uh, so anyway, I've got my summons and I'm ready to go to Redford Magistrates Court, and this is this is what it's all about. And I've got a statement here. Read this statement for you. This is a statement, yeah? This is a statement that was for Redford Magistrates Court. I think you can see the time and the date of the court, actually. Redford Magistrates Court, 8th of February, 2007, yes? I'm the consultant psychiatrist based at Rampton Hospital in the Personal Disorder Directorate. Since the retirement on my predecessor, pre because he left, he retired, so I got passed on because I threatened to kill him. I got passed on a new psychiatrist, uh, which it says in November 2006, I've taken over clinical responsibility. The later is detained under Section 415 Classification Psychopathy in Malvern Ward, the Peach Unit, Rampton Hospital. There is substantial historical and clinical evidence for a diagnosis of severe personality disorder, antisocial type, has the capacity to engage in and respond to psychological therapy to address his disadvantages, personality traits. But you listen, listen to how we contradict, listen to how they contradict themselves. They say that I could, I've got the capacity to engage, but However, during uh, this admission, which is two and a half years, and then three years, totally refusing, it's hard work. 
three years nearly of uh, constantly refusing to participate in assessments and treatment of my mental disorder. They say that I am not, they say, I'm not optimistic that his attitude, attitude towards treatment will change in the foreseeable future. It's debatable whether he can be considered treatable where he remains of this view. Even if they're saying I'm neither failing me, you know, it's, 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 it's absolutely remarkable, incredible what, what they're saying. I'm aware of the behaviour towards his previous RMO, which is the doctor which had threatened, which resulted in the charge of harassment, which is obviously threatening to kill him and, you know, kidnap him and take him home or to all that hostage crap, yeah? Uh, what is it? Uh, mental, uh, yeah. Uh, however, hang on, which, which part am I going? Uh, it's debatable whether he can be considered treatable where he remains of this review. I'm aware that of the behavior towards his previous arrow, more, which resulted of the, the threats to kill. Basically, I've seen many, written, many written threats by his by this patient to the life and safety of other members of his clinical team. Whilst the clinical team are aware that these threats are instrumental, basically, in a bid to get out of the hospital, they're saying that, uh, that they're, taking my, they're taking my threat serious. Uh, and his threats have been taken serious by those targeted. And they're saying that I'm capable of carrying those, those, those threats out. That's If I was to be in there long term, I could really go insane. By being in the hospital, I think it was making me more insane. Uh, so basically, last part, this, this part is important. I read this part out to you, didn't I, before? He said, has a history of violent and offending behaviour and subversive behaviour in institutions. He represents a risk to the public by reason of impulsive, reckless, abnormal, aggressive behaviour. Efforts to engage him in treatment to address his personality disorder have been ineffective. Ineffective. That, in a word, stays, I'm untreatable. Uh, so basically it says, uh, ineffective, his behaviour and associated risk. Should he remain in the hospital system, he's likely to worsen. So they're basically saying, if I was to stay in Rampton, I'm going to get worse. Great fail. Uh, and then it says, I respectfully recommend to the court that he's dealt with by uh, means of a custodial sentence or remanding custody depending on the position of the sentence. When I went into court, he listened to this, the court, the drama room was absolutely, it was electric. You won't believe it. Uh, so I've got like five, five, eight members of staff uh, from Rampton Hospital behind me in the dock. And obviously, this, uh, the, the judge turned around and said, I deal with patients all the time from Rampton Hospital because it's their closest, it's their catchment area. And uh, the CPS stood up and they said, yes, this patient has threatened to kill members of staff, 50 members of staff, his care team, his psychiatrist. This man is an untreatable psychopath. And the judge turned around and says, I'm not having that. To be judged untreatable, it can take up to 25 years. 25 years. I did it in two years. I did it in two years, mate. I got a judge in the court who's dealt with patients from Rampton. And uh, he's turned around and said, I can do, I, I, to, to be judged and treated, it takes 25 years. I did it in two. And he, and the, and the, and the, and the judge turned around and said, I'm going to send this man back to Rampton Hospital with an indefinite section 40, uh, 3741, with an imposition, uh, uh, an imposition of a section 40 women, which means life indefinite section on the mental health act. <gasps> but, there's a but, let me get there. But, listen to this, the CPS stood up and stuck up for me and turned around and says, yes, you want to, but you can't send him back there. I can send him wherever I want. He went, he's threatening to kill his staff. They do not want him there. They cannot cope with him. He's threatening to, to kill him. He's, the, he's breached serious security. He's tried to escape. And he just turned around and shook his head, looked at the paperwork again and says, I do not know what to do with this man, <laughs> apart from the only thing I can do now from that is... I, I remind you into prison custard and I went, yes, <laughs> victory. That's what I went, victory. I went, yes, thank you. And it just went like that. I went, yes, thank you. I beat the system, basically. And do you know something? I'm going to say something. If I wouldn't have done that there, I would never have got out. I would never have got out. If I wouldn't have committed them offences on purpose, on purpose, because I didn't mean them, but if it were going to come to a serious, if more years would have passed, who knows? I could have killed a member of staff. I could have tried eating him. I could have done whatever. My mental health could have deteriorated and got worse. I think it could. Anyone who's detained in them circumstances, anyone uh, would obviously definitely would start losing the plot, wouldn't they? And I was beginning to lose the plot. So I'm very lucky. There were legal loopholes. I got under them. I sneaked under it. And do you know something? In 2007, just as it got out, just, just as it got out, there was a new law implemented in 2007. Everyone can Google it. It's called Mental Health Act 1983, Amendment 2007. And it was saying if, if, if treatment was available and appropriate, and now treatment's always available and appropriate, but then again, I still, I think I still get under the legal loophole of 
I've not engaged in, in two and a half years and constantly refused to engage. And obviously the hospital is still making me worse by eating me on crap and, you know, weeing and threatening the staff on a daily basis. So I, st I think I could still win it, but there's not many people in, in, the, in that system that are very clever and manipulative to use the extent of the intelligence which I used. I think I used, I think, you know, I think, obviously, I think I've got more of an IQ than 75, don't you think, to, to do what I did to get out the way that I did, because I knew exactly what I was doing, didn't I? Definitely. And uh, the, the question is, do I hear voices? I don't know. Do you know? I talk to myself all the time, my friend. Exactly. <laughs> I don't hear voices. No, I don't hear voices. Uh, am I a psychopath? I don't know. I think I've got the traits of being a psychopath. Uh, I've tried to diagnose myself. But do you, know what I, do you know what I think? I definitely know what diagnosis I do have on a level. I do have post-traumatic stress disorder, definitely from the childhood trauma, the abuse that I've suffered. Absolutely. Given all this that's happened, it's, it's, it's horrific. And for someone who's detained in a mental health system, and it, it could be many other people, like I said, there were one person in there, I did a bit of conversation, one person there who had, who was being paralyzed and is in a wheelchair and he uses like a straw to move his wheelchair about. And I said to one member of the staff, how the hell is he a danger to himself or others? He, he's paralyzed from the waist down, he can't even move his, or he, he can't move, he can't even move his arms. He's, he's paralyzed from the neck down, should I say. Uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable that the detaining people like that in maximum security hospitals. I think what they were doing, and I think what they did with me, is bed blocking. They were wasting 180,000 a year per patient. That's what it is. So imagine what they wasted on me by trying to assess and treat me. It was no good. I don't think I should have even been thrown in there. I don't even think I should have been labelled that. I, I've been, I've had these diagnoses. I've had uh, paranoid schizophrenia, personality disorder, psychopathic personality disorder, and the one that remains and still remains around my neck to this day is I suffer from an untreatable personality disorder. And they turn around and say, you take medication, it just helps me sleep, basically. It doesn't help me to calm me things down. Only I can do that. that I believe in self-management. That's not treatment. I've never received any treatment. And to this day, I've still never received any treatment. Obviously, I've got treatment from Dr. Bob, but that kind of treatment is therapy. It's not... It's not forced or coerced on me. I don't want to class Dr. Bob is in that kind of medical world of the horrible, the nastiness. Dr. Bob is a nice person, a genuine psychiatrist, retired, but he, he's, he, he knows exactly what he's doing in his work and his therapy. He did come up with uh, a therapy that I just touched on, uh, and it's called Stop Grander Therapy. So we were talking about the abuse that happened, the trauma, and it was difficult to open up that box to explore it, talk in details, which I'm not going to because uh, it's, it's, not, it's not nice for viewers or myself to go through again. And what I would do, what me and Dr. Bob did, is we wrote down a therapy, and I believe this kind of therapy did work for me. So what I would do is, now that I'm an adult, I would like basically talk to my abuser, Granad is over there. I turn around and say, Granad, I am not a child anymore. You cannot abuse me. You cannot control my life anymore. You cannot mess about with my life. I will not offend. I will not hurt anyone. I will not be explosive. I will not stab. I will not murder. I will not kill. I will not eat. I will not do anything like that to any human person because it, it started from you. You messed my life up and you're not going to do that anymore. He's dead now. But even if he's not dead, you can still talk to that. You can still talk to your, 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 you know, your abuser. And you can tell him and say, enough is enough. It's gone. And when you, when you feel like you've had that rant, and when you've had that rant, it's more than a rant. It's personally lifting it, lifting the lid off and feeling that relief that you're not a child anymore. Because sometimes it feels like you're, you're childlike when you, you go into that again, you know. You, it brings you right back to your you child. The child's got the fear, but now you're putting the power back. That's right. You're a man. I'm a man now, and I've got the, I've got the fear. I've got the control. He hasn't. And I would, and that's what it is. That's, I, I believe it, it can work. You've just got to keep at it and keep at it. And do you know something? It's not insane. It doesn't mean that you're insane by talking to your abuser. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of therapy, and mm -hmm. I like it. And that was called Stop Grandma Therapy between me and Dr. Bob Johnson, and it worked for me. And it continues to still work. Good. It's still something sometimes I still talk about when people talk about, you know, if I meet someone and they've been abused and that, I, I bring it up mm -hmm. and I say, well, I tried this kind of therapy. You should try it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, and I've been out 10 years now. Uh, I haven't killed anyone. I haven't eaten anyone. 
and uh, <laughs> and I don't intend to kill anyone or eat anyone. I think I'm doing all right. Yes, I still battle every single day with my thoughts, but I'm released. And what I what I want to say to finish this off, the mental health system is absolutely a sham. It's a it's a disgusting abuse. The staff in there, the overrun and the abuse patients, they threaten them, they intimidate them, and it needs to be changed. The Mental Health Act 1983, 40 years now, it needs to be changed. Not 1983, a lot of things need to change in the mental health system. And the way that I've gone is basically, and it's, it's in a way, a miscarriage of justice. It's a misfortune what I had to go through. But you know, Summer, I'm glad I've gone through it, and I've got the story to tell. And in a way, I'm not being funny or anything like that, I beat the system. People say you can't beat the system. I did, didn't I? You did. If you look at how much it houses, cost to house one at Rampton, it was hundreds of thousands of pounds a year, and the contracts were in the multi-millions. So there's a devious financial side to this as well, where a lot of Head people, blocking. a lot of people are making money off people that they holding indefinitely, aren't they? Definitely. Yeah. Now the other thing is working on his book. We're going to help him publish it. It's going to be called Untreatable Psychopath. So there's a lot more stories, part two, when his book is published, and it will be available for other interviews and other platforms. And um, he's already written the whole thing up. So we're looking forward to working on that with him. So please look out for that as well. And um, is there anything you'd like to say in conclusion so the people who've been watching this for the last three hours? Uh, no, just uh, if people genuinely want help and that lot, don't lie. Don't go down the road I went. Because, you know, some if you go down that road, why I went? You're not getting out. People might think, oh, I can con it by lying like I did and going under the mental health services. I had no choice at that time, at that age. And then when I did have a choice and I told the authorities that I don't hear voices, they didn't believe me. They still don't believe me to this day. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, what, 42 now? So when did I start that? 14 and I'm 42. And I still can't get rid of that label. The authorities still think I hear voices. I don't hear voices, never have done. Uh, people do hear voices. Yeah, I've got sympathy for them, genuinely. But if people who are trying to beat the system by taking an easier stint in hospital, you think it's easier by being in a hospital than it is prison. No, absolutely wrong. It's easier for me in prison than it was in hospital, as you heard. The difficulties of me getting out, the extremes I had to go to to get myself out of hospital. Yes, I know it was a maximum security, and that was even even harder not just any regional secure unit or little little secure ward. This was a maximum security. You don't get people, I don't think there's anyone, not in the UK that have done what I've done, not a chance. I beat the system, I got through a legal loophole. If I wouldn't have done what I've done on purpose, I would still now be in Rampton Maximum Security Hospital, rotting and festering. Maybe you viewers think that I might still decide that I should be in there, but I'm not. Been out 10 years now, doing all right. Before we go into the interview with Dr. Bob, I just want to reiterate this is an educational video. And one of the main things we're trying to show through true stories is how people who prey on kids, they cause that trauma that is the root cause of crime, extremely dangerous crime. Look how society could be protected if these people who harm kids were locked up for huge sentences, but often they just get slaps on the wrist if they even get a sentence at all. So we're campaigning for the whole justice system to be overhauled, whereby these people who harm kids, they're the ones who get the long sentences, so they're not harming any more kids. And all the victims then could be, go on to create hundreds and hundreds of crimes. Look how many crimes would be prevented. Anyway, hope you enjoy. I just, I just want to yeah. say one more thing Please as well. Uh, I know people and viewers, I just want to say one more thing. People might think, yeah, it deserves to go away for what all these crimes and what I've done. I get that, yes. But I also want to say one more thing. I believe I've doubled my times in the crimes I've committed. I've done near enough life sentences on, my, on one sentence. Yeah, I know people have obviously been doing it similar to the, the sentences. People who serve an IPP sentence is doing double tariffs. I get that. Me, I also done it, but in a different kind of way. I did it in the mental health services. I did like what? Six, I got a six year sentence done, a full nine and a half year out of that full nine and a half year out of that one stretch. Uh, and then obviously 20 odd years. And obviously being out only 12 months and that, not good. So that's what I'm saying. I believe I've been punished for my crimes. If not more, I've done double the time. That's what I'm trying to get at. So I've been punished for my time, if not doubled. Well said. All right, stay tuned for Dr. Bob and give us a hug, man. Brilliant. Yeah, Fantastic. Well done, brother.